Uh, so James and I would go into the classroom and realize like, you know, I would, James would talk to the teacher and I would observe the students. And this is when we were piloting our software. And I realized like, you know, there's a lot we can do and we're seeing progress and the school was happy, the class was happy, the, even the district was happy. But I was so upset because I couldn't reach certain students. Okay, guys, we're here with Travis from Knowledge Hook. Travis, um, you know, I try, I try generally not to get too much into introductions and talk about the people, but generally get right into the flow uh, of things. But for you, man, uh, one of the things I wanted to say before we even catch on is like a lot of the talking, like one of the main talking points in our podcast, we've done 86 episodes and uh, we took a break during COVID, you know, it's been four months since we started. And uh, I'm so, so glad that we're breaking that, uh, that gap with you. Because man, last year, we, I think that was, yeah, last two years ago, we, we were on a call. It was meant to be a 20 minute call, turned into a two hour conversation uh, where you kind of opened up and like, you know, gave some insights into what you think about innovation is and why you're doing what you're doing. And like in that two hours, I got, I felt like I got, got kind of a master class into, uh, you know, your mindset and your ideas. And, uh, you know, I, it's not a lot. I, I talk to people for a lot as a living, you know, I mean, for the past few years. And I haven't met a lot of people who can granulize so much information into, into easily, conceivable, easily digestible components. So I've been really looking forward to having you on and really getting into, into your mindset of how to run things. Uh, Knowledge Hook, uh, you know, you guys just broke news, raised uh, a $20 million Series A round. Congratulations, right? Thank you. Thank you. How are you feeling with all that? Like, this has been quite a journey for you. I know it's been a personal journey. Uh, we'll dive into that as well. But how are you feeling coming off such a, uh, such a big moment? Like, uh... Uh, a lot of gratitude. I have a great team. We are, we're, you know, we're on to something pretty big. And, you know, it's, it's when you, in moments like this, you kind of just think about all the um, sort of the long, the long marathon that you have to run to get here knowing that it's possible that, you know, you might fail. So mm -hmm. it's, it's all good feelings. And of course, you know, there's the, there's always a lag between what, you know, when you accomplish a milestone, there's a lag between like, you know, announcing it or sharing the milestone and where your head's at. So my head's at been a lot right now, just around expansion, market expansion. And uh, there's a lot of exciting things going on inside the company right now that, mm -hmm. um, you know, every Every, every week we're pinching ourselves. Like, I can't believe we accomplished all this in one week. And so it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good place. And it used to be in the beginning, like used to be, um, you know, you take a week, a week of doing things, but, you know, all, if not, if, if not just at least one, uh, almost every day you're failing, testing out a new thing, new thing, new thing. Mm -hmm. right? So it's like you hope that you discover something that week. Uh, that can last for the rest of the company's direction. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, you're just always failing. And then eventually you shift to this sort of situation where you're starting to hit product market fit, go to market fit. And now we're at a stage where like a little bit of effort goes a long way in sort of seeing an impact. So things are snowballing and it's really uh, still the same amount of work, but you see a different yield in terms of results. So it's kind of, an, it's kind of a, a, a weird, uh, exciting feeling, feeling grateful, feeling, you know, um, we took, we took our moment to slow down and celebrate, and then we just got right back at it. Perfect. Uh, absolutely. I mean, like that's a, I mean, that's, a, it's, it's quite a bit of to digest to when you take, uh, such a baby concept, especially something that you've been, so, so been idealizing in your head for so long. Uh, and you know, it's grown to a point where other people are coming in and now you're delegate delegating, you know, things out to people and in and, and, and growth mode, right? So before we go into like, you know, where are you guys at? Can you, you know, we're gonna have, of course, a description of what Knowledge, Knowledge Hook is and the concepts behind it, but what is Knowledge Hook to you? Like, how do you describe it um, in, in the most simplistic ways? And yeah, our purpose is to uh, inspire and develop the problem solvers of tomorrow. And, and the way we do this, is we focus on right now in the short to medium term is focus on creating an end-to-end -end experience for the student around their learning, their journey in learning math. 
Mm -hmm. And by creating an end-to-end -end experience, I mean thinking about the role of the teacher and their journey, uh, going from a teacher who perhaps never taught a subject in math before to having to teach a classroom of 30 students. What does that look like and how can we accelerate their learning and effect effectiveness in teaching? Um, just thinking through that, thinking through the school board's role in that, thinking through in the classroom, what a, you know, what are all the things that teachers need to do to really create an, an enriched learning environment for math and take that same journey all from the class all the way to the home and what mm -hmm. what's the role of the parent and what's what's the future of learning what's the future of homework what's the future of tutoring and so knowledge is this moving thing that is really hyper focused around creating a what I, like we call a vertically integrated experience around that goal um, and a brand that, um, you know, as people come to know us, uh, you can trust, you get a certain sense of excitement and feelings like uh, of, of, you know, love to, brand affinity towards, towards the, uh, to the company and, and that when we eventually extend into other subjects, because it's called knowledge hook, not math hook, or, you know, mm -hmm. and even the purpose statement is not specifically centered around math, but the idea of problems, of tomorrow's problem solvers. So, it's it's creating the doorway to open up this initial milestone would create the you know sort of an opening to do other subjects eventually as well but doing it doing it properly for the first one in a way that no one's connected things before yeah and that's the kind of sideway uh, segues into the, the next point i want to drive back is that right from the beginning we were very open and vocal about the, per, the what the, the role math played uh, in your your growth and development, especially uh, when you were younger, yeah, coming from an uh, academically inclined family and personally having some struggles with it, uh, can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I struggled in math uh, when I was a kid. Um, I struggled in every subject when I was a kid, and mm -hmm. um, my uh, my dad was a math tutor back in Sri Lanka, Jeez. and uh, he yeah he and he was qu quite an inspirational story. He came from a relatively poor family, couldn't afford tutoring, taught himself math, borrowed the, you know, what they called the tuition books. His friends mm -hmm. gave him all their tuition books. He, he copied thousands upon thousands of pages and answers and everything, and then gave those books back, taught himself math, and then became so good at it, he started teaching, became, he, he was a tutor at, I want to say 11, 13, around that time. And then to the point where math teachers send their children to his class. He was quite a popular tutor. I remember growing up hearing people approach us randomly at the gas station. Turns out it was one of my dad's students. Now he's an accountant and he's telling me the story of, you know, what my dad did for them. And I just remember doing, meeting so many of his students who uh, immigrated to Canada. And so I had him for a dad. So I honestly thought like intelligence skipped a generation. So when I found out I was the poorest performing kid in my class, uh, it was a grade four, um, left the report card. Uh, envelopes opened so everyone started comparing and they just found out I was at the kid I was literally at the bottom so I went home and I noticed that my parents weren't all that surprised but they they, they almost had like a like almost like a crisis mode PR crisis mode response it's like they, they didn't look surprised but like no 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 it's okay it's fine here's what we're gonna do so I think at some level they, they I mean I found out later that they were they knew that I was struggling in general and they had done things to sort of help me get by but was trying to figure out how to help me in general. So I think I just found out just how bad it was. And so my dad said, let's just focus on math, forget the other subjects. And eventually I started to slowly do well in math and notice that others struggled in the subject. And then I was just curious, you know, like what, did, how did I, you know, how did I get good at this? And uh, can I do this same thing for the other subjects? My mom helped me in school as well. Um, she, she quit her job, she stayed at home to, to help but I uh, went on to do, wow. um, yeah, so that, that was sort of the inflection. I had this like weird continuous improvement process. I'd just obnoxiously go back to the teacher and say, you know, okay, I got a D here. Can you just, you know, can you help me understand the feedback so I can, you know, see if I can improve. At the time I was, you know, analyzing the feedback. At minimum, mm -hmm. I could at least understand why my brain works a certain way. Why is it stupid or slower than the others? That's what I used to think. And then over time though, like every time the teacher gave me the feedback, and we broke it down. I just, I could, I could take that on. That's not a, I can actually work on that. 
And so mm-hmm. I, what eventually became, you know, what started off as a, analyzing my own failures, just out of curiosity as to why am I different, started becoming this little secret weapon of like, if I keep doing this, I can actually climb pretty high. And so mm-hmm. all the way to high school, went on to win the um, governor general, went on to get full scholarship. Uh, I did a year at NSI, had a struggle there. That's another story. And then I went on to Waterloo. Yeah. I can I can share a little bit about that too. And then went on to Waterloo. And then I eventually graduated uh, with an offer from Apple and uh, Microsoft. Um, wow. And the imposter syndrome carried right into Microsoft, um, mm-hmm. you know, where I solved this problem. And that really... For me, the inflection, the true, the true moment that set me on this course was realizing that, um, you know, when I was able to solve this problem, that was what felt uh, was unsolvable. Like no one, no one had a solution for it. it was the number one problem affecting Microsoft Office. Um, so at the time, it was not solved, and uh, I think they were just they gave me this area to look at because it was probably the least interesting area. Uh, nothing had changed, I guess, fundamentally in that area. Mm-hmm. So. So they gave it to me, I looked at it, I, I ended up solving, designing a solution to solve that problem. And ultimately, I think when I got the recognition for that and I started to realize the significance of it, that's when I had the confidence that maybe I can push on the edge of human knowledge, I could test this thing out. So that's been my story. That's how I kind of, I think that was for me the big, the big moment, the big aha of like, hey, maybe I can do this. Uh, but there's yeah. been a lot of other things that sort of help influence me that way to go down that path. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that childhood almost trauma of like, you know, being at the bottom of the class, like struggling with school, uh, that stays with people a lot. And, uh, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they typically don't do well in school. And it's either, I think they fall into two buckets, right? Like either school is not made for them in the sense that it's not fitting their learning patterns or, they, you know, they're just interested in other things that were not being taught in school or not being covered at the time. Or two is that they distracted. It was almost like neurological, where like this was not the environment for them, right? They were just ADD or couldn't focus or dyslexia or like, you know, all these different issues come into play, right? Uh, like, you know, going back to you, like it seems like you had tremendous support at home. You know, if oh, your yeah. mom, you know, you know, uh, left her job to help you full time and uh, climb with that, like, would you isolate the problem being, you were just you weren't interested in, in what was happening in school or was it that you personally struggled to keep up with the subject matter where would you fall in that uh my parents you know they, they my dad like used to tell stories at home so i never felt guilty about not being interested or not being and i probably was not interested in the beginning um very early on But I started getting really interested and it was this weird, like very roundabout way that my dad, you know, kind of wired that in us, just ask, Mm -hmm. you know, like admiration for those who sort of, you know, aspire to to things at an early age. And so like the way he would storytell about, you know, people he grew up with and his story, right. And, you know, the way he would find a way to work it in and, never felt like a lecture it felt and it didn't even feel like it was a trick right Mm -hmm. he would so many stories and so it just um you know and i just remember creek like all of a sudden admiring the smartest kids in the class and it just became this like you know i put them on a pedestal in many ways right admired the gifted the gifted class and watched like the gifted class you know do these like rockets you know and so that I would then with my friends and I would take part of a remote control car and try to do the same thing, even though I'm not in the gifted program, just during recess, but just admire like uh, that for whatever reason. And I don't know if that, um, you know, for me, maybe that's that with the support system helped me sort of um, get on that track. But I, yeah, you're right. Like uh, the school systems, um, you know, I, I just, I, I can't think of, there's just, there's quite a few stories of entrepreneurs who fall off that wagon and, uh, that's part of their journey and, and, and they end up starting a company. But I imagine that if you look within their story, they probably have a really amazing support system of some sort, like the one I had, which I would argue is the lottery ticket for many. Mm, yeah. Um, and I imagine that though, as many stories as we hear around that, there's far more people who don't have that and really rely on a strong 
educational infrastructure, great education policy and other policies to really help, um, you know, create that. So that's, that's, that's my passion because I know I have the lottery ticket and I know that maybe, you know, some of the entrepreneurs that I, I was inspired by, you know, um, have similar interesting uh, relationships in their journey with education. But I also know far more people, the ones we never hear about, um, don't get that kind of opportunity because of other factors. And so it really comes down to, you know, education reform and improving, you know, the system mm -hmm. uh, to optimize the human potential, I guess. Right. But I agree did, with you. Did you feel at all like the system ever let you down or it wasn't, it didn't adapt to you? Uh, it wasn't, you know? Uh, actually, no. Um, but I'm sure people have experienced that. And again, that could be my unique journey. And maybe that's why I went into education. I, I, I felt teachers, certain teachers might have let me down. But I usually almost forget those teachers. I, you know, when your story ends the way that, like, mine did, right? Um, I don't have any resent towards some of the, like, the report card, the teacher who left the report card um, open. Man, hmm. I got to tell you, like, she, she had this system where she would step out of the classroom um, almost every day, at least three or four times a day. Um, what I think now was probably a smoke break. Mm -hmm. I look back at the cadence of it. And then she would appoint someone in the class to sort of go up on the wall. And if anyone talks, you put up their name. If they talk again, you put up like an, a little X beside it. And for every time their name appears and every instance beside it, um, you have to do the times table, one, to, one times one all the way to 12 times 12. Mm -hmm. And so what so this one girl, apparently later I found me, I think she had a crush on me or something, mm -hmm. but she started doing this thing uh, where she would put my name and then put an X beside it like 24 times. <laughs> and the teacher would like be happy to come in and say, oh, Travis was talking. Okay. And then I would have to do timetables, you know, one times one, all the way to 12 times 12, time tw 24 times. That was the height of like, I, I was like, and, I, and she would like, did she think I wanted to do this every day that she stepped out? Like, I was just shocked at how she was totally okay. So there are bad examples like that. Where, uh, where'd you go to school? <laughs> like, what, uh, what area? I went, to, I went to school in Scarborough. In but Scarborough. the same, at the same time, like, for every one of those teachers, which was, like, the odd, odd example, I, ha I can tell you, like, three or four incredible teachers that changed my life, that put yeah. me on this track. Yeah. And Mrs. Griffin, who, oh my gosh, like I was struggling in her class, but like she gave hope to my parents. She gave hope to me, just an incredible human being. Um, and then went on to, you know, I had other great teachers along the way. Um, and so that teacher was sort of sandwiched be between two of my, you know, in most favorite teachers in, in my entire experience. And then I went on to high school and I had these teachers who took us to these math competitions Mm -hmm. you know and and give us life advice on the way and back yeah right and you know all kinds of so I, so i can't quite say that the system you know the canadian education system is actually remarkably better than many around the world mm -hmm. now having to you know do what i do i see i see a lot um and that could have that could also put a potentially have clouded my you know experience in terms of you know comparing it to relatively other to relative to other systems but I can't, I do, I do believe you. Like, I do agree that I have friends and others who, where the system has failed them in many ways. Um, and yeah. And so that there's, yeah, there, but it, in my particular example, it's just not the case. Yeah. Um, you know, when I asked about where do you went to school in Scarborough, like, I think this is a very personal pain point of mine because I went through the Scarborough school system as well. Yeah. And one of the most interesting things that, I, I could never shake but Scarborough was that, you know, Scarborough was built like, you know, by American architects for like, you know, white collar, right, middle class families who would go out and buy cars, right? Really? Everything's yeah. all space. Yeah, in the 60s, right? Scarborough and Mississauga was built as subdivisions, right? So suburbs, right, from the main city of Toronto by American architects. The whole point is like the grocery store, the kind of the corner stores, everything is far enough away that you would need a car to get there and the bus routes would be only the major intersections and wouldn't go into the smaller areas uh, deeper in, right? So it, would, it was purposely designed so that if you want to comfortably live, you need one or two cars, right? right. 
And, um, you know, it was meant for, you know, the typical nuclear family, uh, you know, uh, uh, like suburban um, like a household. And, and it was sold as such, you know, Scarborough to this date has the largest lot size per house in all of North America. Really? Second, yeah, okay. like largest lot house on average for all of North America. And when the, the, in the 90s, end of the 90s, sorry, the beginning of the 90s, end of the 80s, there was a sudden, uh, you know, burst of immigrants coming in. The demographics suddenly shifted within Scarborough. And even though these immigrants came into these houses and, um, you know, the demographics changed, the same property tax was being paid, but suddenly the programs within, within the area suddenly shifted. Uh, my high school, for instance, Lamoureux, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, was one of the best-rated sports programs, right? One of the best-rated science programs, one of the best-rated musical programs. Uh, when I went there in the 2000s, like the sock, like the like in the we had a huge field behind us, enough for like literally four uh, soccer fields, right? Two baseball diamonds, right? Uh, one huge football uh, like uh, field. Wow. Camp, like, like, it's a huge field. It's huge. Like, it goes on, right? And in this, in a, in like, like, overgrown by vegetation is an obstacle course. Uh, the baseball diamond is unkept. Uh, four of the, uh, of the five soccer fields, right? Sorry, the four soccer fields were completely abandoned. Um, people who lived in the area came and mowed the grass and then maintained it to play themselves, Right. Um, all the baseball, all the equipment was out of date. Musical instruments, music classes were, were canceled. Art still kind of happened, right? But like, you know, schools are paid for by the property taxes in the area. People still pay the same property tax, but, it, the de- but because the demographic shifted, the programs shifted, right? And I, I started realizing this early on because, you know, I'll, I'll share a personal story, but, but like the teachers who taught in all these schools did not live in the area. They were, a lot of them were coming from Peterborough, like driving in an hour away. Hmm. And I, I, from a young age, I always thought this was very curious. I started asking my teachers, where you're from? Because none of them, which would tell me they live in that area. And the reason why I got super interested in this was because, you know, when I was a child, when I was a kid, Travis, like, I, I think we talked about this earlier uh, before as well, was that for me, it was the like exact opposite. I was like a really curious person. Uh, like, you know, I, my mom was really into math. She wasn't a math tutor, but she loved math. Like she loved it. And her love like came on to me. Like, and uh, like by the time, like she would teach me advanced math at home. By the time I was grade three, grade four, I was doing like uh, algebra, right? I was learning algebra, I was, I was learning uh, trig. And uh, my, my dad was super into science. He would bring in science, like, you know, science, uh, scientific American, uh, like, uh, brought, like magazines home and all this stuff. And we'll talk about, you know, Stephen Hawking's uh, theory of like black hole relativity and all these like theories and all these high concepts. And it was the point where like, I was reading, like by the time I graduated each school that I went to, you know, elementary, middle school, high school, I read every book in the library, you know? And I was just so curious to get knowledge. School for me was so boring because it was so slow. But rather than realize that, my teachers did not like that. I remember grade three, my grade three teacher at the time was, uh, sorry, yeah, grade three teacher at the time was trying to, was telling everybody that, you know, trying to explain what a nuclear bomb was. And she was saying a nuclear bomb was uh, created from a liquid that a a teaspoon of it could blow up all of Toronto. And I remember raising my hand up, it's like a nuclear bomb is created by uranium Right. And the, the earliest ones were two pieces of uranium that came together at such force that would trigger an explosion. It was not a liquid. And all I remember is that week um, I got assigned to special education. Are you serious? Yeah. So I got thrown into, uh, even though I was, I was reading novels by for first grade, I was thrown into ESL. And then by the time I was in grade three, I was put in a special ed. Wow. And all, all this in special ed with all the brown kids. Right. And it really threw me off school. Like I hated school. This I despised it. Wow. I right? was going to say, because uh, I always give the short, I, I, you know, I always give the short version of my story, but um, I was in St. Rose. Uh, I started there in grade two. My parents moved me there because in, in St. Nicholas, where I was, uh, I think in grade one, they wanted me, they wanted me to move to special education. Hmm. And I think I was though struggling 
with reading, whereas it sounds like you were the exact opposite. Yeah. And I think I was, in fact, um, you know, having the challenges that you were not. I think this is in the book Outliers. Like, I'm trying to think in Glad Malcolm Gladwell, but like how two people, um, you know, could have completely different, you know, drastic, you know, inflections or directions simply by these small little things, right? Yeah. But um, my parents, you know, when, when they heard that, they were panicking. That's when my mom quit. So, okay, became a stay-at-home mom. And uh, so that was a decision that, like, they, they – um, she, she stepped up and said, you know, I'll, I'll stay home and teach him English and teach him to make sure he can read and write and, and uh, you know, survive school. So he was, it was really my mom who was the first person to step in and really help. She would volunteer mm -hmm. at the schoolyards and stuff like that, oversee everything. If she felt like I was being treated unfairly, she was there to step up and stuff. It was a huge sacrifice. But I think, you know, when you talk about what you just said there, it's funny because I was supposed to go to, I was, I was supposed to go to, go to that program. Mm -hmm. um, so it's on, but you sounds like you, by all accounts, I don't understand why you would have to go to that program if you were reading. Uh, Teachers that didn't like, want to deal that? with me, I guess. Huh? <laughs> they don't want to deal with the, uh, being. Uh, that's not what being special told, education uh, is, right? Special education yeah. is something else. If anything, mm -hmm. that sounds like a gifted. The gifted program would have been what you would have. Uh, Go, go, you would have been taken to the gifted program, if anything. Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought of thinking about this till recently. Uh, and my mom brought this up saying, you know, I actually brought the story up and was telling me about this about a few months ago, like during yeah. COVID, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're all having a family chat. And she was telling my wife about this story. And, uh, and I was like, you know, I kind of remember this. And what, uh, what really triggered the fact was she said, it's like, you know, like I stopped teaching you at, like advanced math. I thought like you were being bored. So I'm like, you're going to struggle in school. So she stopped pushing me. Same thing with my dad. He was like, you know, he went from like teaching, talking about uh, like, you know, all these obscure theories to now forcing me to do schoolwork, which made me hate school even more. And my, my, my grades went the exact opposite way, right? I went from like, a, a, like an A student to like a D student. And I was flat out D until like a, D, like a consistent D student until 11th grade. I remember once at one point, trying to calculate what mark I would have to get like on each exam, each test to get exactly 50% on the dot in, in each grade as kind of like a FU to the whole thing, right? I just passed, but to the point where I have calculated this and got this mark because, you know, I can, I can control, I have control to do that, right? That's how out of control I felt. Uh, the education system like i hated the whole thing the idea of you know bell sounds and five minutes later the second bell sounds and you better have gone to your locker picked up your stuff got to class and like you know you're sitting down by then and if you're late you know you get you get in trouble and like all these things i was constantly in detention i was constantly being being like you know like put into a different bucket and it made no sense because the, the kids then i i started hanging out with were not in the same category would not interest me as much right so i, I always felt out of place and because of that, the education system, like I could like, you know, as I started getting learning in my career into, you know, entrepreneurship and, and seeing the innovation industry, you know, I ended up becoming like a entrepreneur resident at the University of Toronto, you know, with this professor really recognized some talent in me and took me in and says, you know, you should be teaching. Um, you know, you started three companies before you turned 25, you know, you're going to start more, come into the university environment, um, you know, keep creating, doing what you do, but use the resources here. And in the meantime, teach these kids how to hustle right and that now being an insider into the education system like was really weird for me because until university education did not make sense university you suddenly become like an open it's an open field to like you know learn what you want to learn as a pace that you want to learn you know it's more open-ended that was great but like going back to like you know Maybe knowledge entrepreneurship is uh I think you I think you kind of hit on something there, which is like in many ways entrepreneurship is a bit of an outsider business, right? Mm -hmm. You somehow you become an outsider or you get kicked out in some way or feel that you got kicked out. Mm -hmm. And then what kind of getting kicked out of the system allows you to look at the system and then start to potentially change it. Absolutely. And that's what it really is, right? I think mm -hmm. so kind of kind of 
even though our stories are different, um, there's similarities in the outsider form, right? Um, I think that's a key key component to entrepreneurship. Yeah, I mean, you. I think you discussed that already about the about the what is it? The outsider uh, syndrome, right? Like, um, oh, that's the imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. Yeah, no, no, that's you what know, I, I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah, like, how does that affect you, like uh, professional life? And oh and man, I still through. have it. Like I, it still kicks in every now and then. So like, yeah, <laughs> I like to say, oh yeah, and that was the moment that it was all gone, right? Yeah, for a few minutes, and then something else kicks in. So what happens is like, I can tell all kinds of like when you look back, like you you realize, oh, you did this for this reason. So if you walked into my office at Microsoft, you would have seen that it looked like an intern's office, like someone who's just coming and going, whereas everyone else. Settled in, had a couch, had this, had that. You know, I, I, it, it was an empty desk with, you know, um, and just practically everything was empty except for the computer and me coming in. And, and I didn't have, I didn't personalize it in any way. And mm-hmm. that's probably because I, I really didn't think I was going to last. And I was just focused on, um, I didn't want to get too comfortable, right? Because then I get mm-hmm. attached or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that's, that was the imposter syndrome at Microsoft. When I, um, when I was at the um, uh, interview process, I bought the keychain for, for Apple, where I was, San Jose, I think, and also for um, Seattle, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, I had friends it, uh, at the, um, who came to visit me at the uh, Seattle office and then, you know, just the, the hotel and just you know, caught up, used as an opportunity and experience to see something that I probably would never go and see in any other case. Mm-hmm. And when I went to the Apple interview the same day, instead of going to the hotel, I knew I was within 30 minutes away from um, Las Vegas and I went to see a magician. <laughs> I, I did magic when I was a kid, right? So yeah, yeah. you never had a chance to see David Copperfield or Lance Burton. And so I went to see Lance Burton and I flew down the same day of the interview. After the interview, I just went there and then came back and then left from um, Apple. I, I was not expecting any offers from either. But so I guess that's the imposter syndrome right there. Gotcha, man. Um, yeah. So, my, so coming from this environment, like, you know, you told me um, right when you started Knowledge Hook, we, we, you know, I had the privilege of knowing you like to a different blocks in this process, this entrepreneurial journey you had with Knowledge Hook, where, you know, in the, in the, very, in the very beginning, you've been like very adamant of like, you know, how can I prevent other kids like me who had this kind of problem? Like, how can we identify them earlier on? How can you give them the tools to personalize education? Yeah. Right? And that, that personalizing education part is, I think is really great because you know, think about it, like, you know, you mentioned this too, and I think uh, I haven't mentioned my story yet, but ba- basically like if you hadn't met that right teacher who kind of kickstarted your interests or, or like inspired you or pushed you or, 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 or brought thing, something out of you that was like, you know, uh, like a, you know, a kernel that was not developed, you know, how scary was that, would, would that be, right? Like, you know, the effect of the right person at the right time, right? And we yeah. think of edu- educators, like, right, you know, they follow the trend of like the, the 80-20 rule right? 20% uh, of the population outperforms 80%. Same with teachers, right? 20% probably the ones who really care, the ones who can really communicate it really well, the ones who really understand the subject matter, the ones who actually love it, you know? And how can we, with technology, connect the, the right educators or the right type of uh, education or the right type of work, learning about something to the students who deserve it, who, who need it, right? And how do you personalize education? Yeah, there's a long history of um, people making an attempt to do this. And, uh, you know, I believe there's a quote with Edison talking about how slide projectors or sorry, the projector, the movie reel could potentially flip the classroom. Um, and the radio, similar quotes from famous radio broadcasters, television. Oh, we don't need teachers. Let's replace like a really well-designed, you know, television show you know, with a great teacher can replace a teacher. Let's flip the classroom, the television. Went on to computers, you know, the, the, the Steve Jobs was famously quoted, um, you know, you know, over, over um, estimating what his computer was gonna be able to do in education. And then mm-hmm. later, 10, 15 years later, um, ate humble pie. Uh, and then Reed Hastings invested in a company called Dreambox in the beginnings made some similar claims later said, Oh my God, it's a lot more complicated than it really is. Um, um, then I think they really understood. And the most famous one I would argue is Sal Khan and Bill Gates 
and on a TED talk around 2000, around the flipped classroom again, AI is now going to be the next one. So I think education is a far more complicated thing um, because, you know, the human mind is very complicated. The thinking machine is really, really complicated. And to look for a silver bullet is analogous to what happened in medicine, I believe. Um, I want to say 18th century, but perhaps it was even earlier than that, where they use this concept called, um, practice called bloodletting, uh, where they use leeches for almost everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and modern medicine eventually took over and understood that a lot of issues are related to various things and the human body is like a black box and you know there's many complications that could cause something to go wrong and you know today when you look at medicine you look at doctors all doctors in a great health system have to you know you can't rely on just the 20 percent of doctors you have to create a health system that really you know um can really support and tool up doctors across the entire system. And that's why in, in the testament to that is our, the average lifespan going up in, in, the, in the developed world, right? Mm -hmm. And so you need a, a sophisticated set of tools that are specialized and you need to be able to recognize the complexity of the human body and how to you know, support it across a range of issues that arise. And I think education in some way, in many ways is, is no different. It's a black box. And uh, sometimes we look at ed tech as the, I look at it as like the way people are looking at this ed tech problem is like one big silver bullet, like a, a leech, the bloodletting of, you know, old, old medicine methods. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we were able to do, and maybe it's because of, unlike Gates, and unlike all these super smart people who, uh, you know, saw all the potential of ed tech and thought I could learn with this tool and assume that everyone else could, I was the opposite type of technology guy. Mm -hmm. I struggled. I was the slow one, right? So when we went into the classroom and I was going, I was looking for kids like me. And when I realized my software couldn't reach them, you know, at the time it was just uh, me and two other co-founders or three other co-founders, I should say. And uh, so James and I would go into the classroom and realize like, you know, I, James would talk to the teacher and I would observe the students. And this is when we were piloting our software. And I realized like, you know, there's a lot we can do and we're seeing progress and the school was happy, the class was happy, the, even the district was happy. But I was so upset because I couldn't reach certain students. And we could have, you know, commercialized the product years ago. Um, but I just felt that this is, you know, this is not why I left Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make money, but I could have just stayed. There's a more practical way to, to make money. So I thought, and I also had this belief that the, the more I can focus on those kids who I couldn't reach, and solve that problem, which felt a lot like an unsolvable problem. The more I can chip away at that problem, the more likely I can build a much more groundbreaking solution. And so I was stubborn enough to stick around long enough. It was a key, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint with, with you know, building a, you know, a good company. Um, and I thought, okay, the more I can stick around and solve that problem, uh, not only will I make a larger impact, but one with competitive advantages that will help me, you know, um, not get gobbled up by a you know larger company or something like that. There's enough complexity mm -hmm. here to work through and solve and create a great solution that um, can give me a, re a good enough excuse for why I left Microsoft um, to pursue something like this, um, and also at the same time build a real company that doesn't just you know become a single ideas company. That oh that's a great idea, kid. You know we're 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 this big company over here, and we'll just throw a guy here and add a feature and you're done. Like I didn't want that to happen either. So um, I had three co-founders who, you know, put out their blood, sweat and livelihood and their families made sacrifices too. So I needed to make sure this thing um, had competitive moats along the way, just as much as it was making an impact. So this is kind of uh, how, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but this is kind of what my thinking was as I was tackling this space. and how I look at it is more like medicine and how I feel like, I feel like sometimes when I look at the ed tech landscape, sometimes I see it's almost like a time machine from equivalent to medicine to seeing some really archaic ways of thinking mm. about what's happening in the classroom. And I think it's far more sophisticated and it's really going to rely on, you know, companies that um, understand that, that this is a far more complex problem and really get into the nuance. That's why we're so focused on that. Right. Um, I realized it is there's a lot of 
there's a lot of nuance, a lot of moving parts, even within each topic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a universal subject. And I don't know who doesn't want to or feel the need to have to uh, be numerate, right? To be able to uh, be mathematically uh, capable of understanding the math. Uh, math is in every, in every part of our journey, right? So it's also the gateway to STEM subjects and um, you know, financial literacy. So just realizing the significance of this subject and that we haven't even made a, a dent at the time when I was kind of playing in the space um, and understanding how complex this was, I, I thought this was a great place to sort of lay the flag and, and, and begin the, the mountain climb. And what was the what was the lightning moment when you're like when you're like you you had this nice career path it's corporate life right and you were like I need to leave this or I need to do something what was the lightning moment I didn't really have yeah I never had a there were lots of there were lots of there were lots of lightning moments but never one that went from leave Microsoft start knowledge or there was a lot of like in between things and then I, I didn't know it was going to be math. Like I had no idea, but I knew it was going to be ed tech. So when I went to do my MBA at Queens, I knew I wanted to start a company. I wanted to learn everything about bu building a business. I thought, you know, going and doing an MBA made sense at the time. Mm. I even remember in the interview, I was like, I think I'm going to be building an ed tech. Uh, and I spent uh, that year at Queens just essentially learning everything about building a business. I had, ironically, I had read a lot of the books that were recommended when I got into the program. And they had given Coles notes and assignments. And a lot of people didn't have time to read at that point. They had too much homework. But I had read a lot of the books before I even showed up. I, 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 was, I thought everyone was going to be like that. Yeah, like yeah. super into the, the, the idea of building a business. And I realized, nope, there's some folks who want to go to finance. Some folks want to go to consulting. And some folks are just here in between. And uh, there were very few I could you know, relate to in terms of wanting to build an actual business. I did find one of my co-founders there. Um, but anyway, so, so I remember um, knowing it was in net tech and then I just, I, so the big epiphany was when I started reading the biographies uh, of folks who had, you know, pioneered new things, uh, del delving even further uh, about Gandhi and other social activists, uh, musicians, artists, um, I think Outliers just came out around that time too. Um, so this is, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's book. I just reading in general about folks and stories and the idea of achieving mastery and making a dent and I saw a common pattern and you know kind of there is a bit of a right time right place uh, something is fundamentally the equation is is uh, such that you know you they, it just needs someone to push and there's a bit of an inflection moment if you can push in a certain area and you know in, in this case it was technology and the trends that were happening and and for me personally it had to be something that you were just truly emotionally connected to because pursuing entrepreneurship uh, you know there are much more rational ways to make money. Mm -hmm. Just get a job. I, it's not. A, it's not a money making. It's definitely not the top. It's nowhere near the top of the list for, you know, if I need to to pay the bills or I need to make you know uh, money to live a really cushy love job. There are lots of great career tracks you can take with that. Um, you know, entrepreneurship. I think it, at least you know the the, the the kind that I was reading about required you to be a little irrational, a little emotional, a little bit. You wanted to do something in a space that was perhaps unsexy by every normal standard at the time and no one was interested in, but you saw something there and you would regret, you would regret not trying more than you would regret trying and failing. Mm -hmm. You needed that irrational, emotional reason to pursue. And for me, education, I was doing a lot of volunteer work on the side, alongside Microsoft, I had a co-founder and I, another co-founder who I started, my first co-founder, Lambo, who we both did a lot of not-for-profit work. And so I was feeling frustrated because it wasn't really making the impact that I, I wished it did. And so while, um, so I wasn't made for, I was not made to build not-for-profits. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized later I was made to build a company, but all of that taught me that, you know, I needed something that I, you know, I felt like I can, you know, really, really feel good about when I'm 80 years old and looking back and have no regrets. Um, and, and finally, the most important thing, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And that means I need to have the supports, mm -hmm. right? And I was at the time dating someone who is now my wife. 
And I remember even having a conversation with her saying, you know, I'm thinking of starting a company. I'd left Microsoft at this point. I'm thinking of starting a company or, you know, doing something really big um, and making a lot of sacrifice. It's not going to be fun. Are you sure you want to, you know, date this guy? <laughs> right? I left Microsoft I'm... and she stuck, stuck with me. And yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it was, it was a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, a journey, but a few things needed to be right. And honestly, man, like you can't, it's not for everyone, but it's also, there's a lot of luck in, you know, the cards you were dealt. And even now that I'm here, I heard Elon say this just recently. He doesn't, he, someone, someone asked him like, you know, I don't, um, a lot of people wish they were you and he, and he chuckled and he said, I don't know if I, I, I don't, I wish I wasn't me. Mm. Right. And I, I kind of know what he's talking about. Like, I, like these are scars from eczema hmm. that kicked in about three and a half years ago. Like your skin, like literally my skin felt like it was on fire at times, you know, in this journey. And, uh, was it, from the like stress of it all? Huh? was it from the stress of it all? Yeah. Yeah. Like it was all over my, my body, eczema. I met, I know a few other entrepreneurs who, you know, um, done well and essentially, you know, uh, told me, yeah, yeah. Like if I know this female entrepreneur has done really well in Waterloo. And, yeah. Eczema. Oh yeah. You got it too. It's either eczema, night sweats, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Like the, like it's a weird, you know, and the only thing left is, all right. You know, there were certain times of like, all right, so I'm one of those, uh, I'm one of the ones who failed, but you know, at least I tried. I was, I was, you know, arriving to, there were moments where I felt like that's, that was going to be my story. Um, I mean, for you, I mean, during this knowledge of journey, you got married, you had a kid, you're a father now. I mean, you can imagine how much you, you were going through. Uh, was a stress about like the, uh, about the, your, your personal life that you had to balance with the, with the, with the company? Yeah. Was yeah. it the imposter syndrome of like, you know, building this company and not knowing how to, like, you know, how, how that's going to be? Like, where, where was the stress all coming from? This, this stress, that's a really great question. It's funny. It wasn't a, so for me, one of the biggest blessings my mom taught me, um, there's a book, you know, how not to give a F, <laughs> I think it's called or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, just not care about what other people think. And, and, and in the sense that like, don't be controlled by social, your social mirror, what other people perceive of you, but control your life based on what you want to be and who you think you are and what, you know, that versus, you know, trying to live up to other people's perception or try to fit into other people's perception. My mom, like in many ways in my journey, drilled that into me. So the one thing that did not stress me and the one thing I always had and probably was the biggest ace is I never cared about when I, even when I was at Microsoft, I didn't care what that might have made me look. I bought a Toyota Corolla. The other mm. guys who came from Waterloo had like BMWs. I didn't know anything about cars going in there. And I bought the CE because, you know, I, I remember Corolla being a really good car. And I had no idea that, I, I, ironically, I didn't even think about the status implication of that, driving around mm. in Corolla, right? And, and it was just because I just didn't, I literally that one, th that, that perhaps was probably my biggest blessing. So the stress for me wasn't what people think of me. The stress for me was what I could have done for my parents after all that they had given me and the clock was ticking, right? And I knew I had, you know, Microsoft and all this experience in my resume and I could turn around and basically, um, you know, get a job and do that stuff, right? The stress for, for me was, okay, I know my wife said she's going to support me and I know why she's making a lot of sacrifices, but I could have done more at home. I could have done more for the people around me, uh, my sisters. So the stress, the eczema was actually just like, look at all these people who are smiling and, you know, pain, in pain because of me. And then, mm -hmm. you know, my co-founders have family members, right? And, you know, James has two kids. I just have my two and a half now. Like what, like, what is he going to, right? So like the people who are coming along for the journey too, right? So the stress for me was all of those things. And, yeah. of like um, having to get this right um, because, you know, I thought, okay, I can take care of my parents. Um, they can survive a little while. I mean, it's not like they, they, they couldn't take care of themselves. You know, these are just things that we all put on ourselves. 
yeah. right? But, um, you know, that part, like everyone was suffering around me and I couldn't bear that piece. Uh, but not like, you know, this, like not me myself. Like I, like, and, and I, that is, I got to say though, that is just as hard um, because, you know, I, I, maybe I was blessed with that sort of um, uh, nurtured or maybe some part, partly genetic, partly nurtured of just being able to walk into a room maybe, and the magic shows, like, I, like if I made a mistake, I just move on. Like if I couldn't trick you and you caught my trick and, or like, I just didn't, um, I could walk in front of a room and, 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 and do a presentation, express a vulnerability. I wasn't afraid of those things. Like it didn't impact me. And that was maybe, but I do think that if part of entrepreneurship, you do go through a lot of things and that can be a stressor as well. You know, if, if you're, if you feel like if, if people's perception of you can affect your own um, security, then that is also a very wo wounding experience throughout entrepreneurship because you, you go through this dark period where, you know, every, you're working 10 times as harder, but you're not seeing the ex external rewards of it, monetary or, you know, any, any, anything that's, you know, just visible to anyone yeah. else. So they just, it just looks like people from everyone else's perspective, it just looks like you're digging a, a hole and you, you're still digging and there's nothing there and you're just digging and you, you look like a crazy person. Um, so I think that that's... Was there, uh, was there ever a moment where you had to defend, um, you know, or justify what you were doing to those around you where it's like, no, just give me more time or uh, how, was the support, how was the support around you? Yeah, so my wife, I... You know, maybe this was a fortunate thing for me too. When I, um, um, yeah, I fell in love with her, but I also recognized I got lucky in the person that I fell in love with because I was able to carry certain type of conversations with her that I just never had been able to in the past. And, um, and I knew that like she understood the long game in this. Like, I, she was just like, my wife's a really, really talented individual and um in many ways um you know we went through what's called a dip there's a really great book about this i don't know if you've heard of it um where you know in life you kind of go through school and you a little bit of work a little bit of reward a little bit of work a little bit of reward, then you go get a job and, and the same thing and then you hit this plateau and you're like what's going on like isn't this isn't this an escalator all the way up here and, and you realize like oh and then you see all these people that are kind of like over here and you're like how do i get to that spot are you soon to just continue this way? Because school and graduation and, you know, the first few promotions taught you that it should just keep going. But, like, he writes this really great book about, I think it's Seth, Seth Golden or something, about a dip. Mm. And really, it's the opposite. It's just, And this is the entrepreneurial dip. It's a dip for, for many things. Achieving world-class mastery to pioneer new things. Whether you're Gandhi or anyone had to go through what's called a dip. And it's this idea that, like, you're putting all this effort, but it looks like you're going backwards. You're not getting rewarded. You're getting punished. And you're just going down this. And the, the deeper and the longer that dip is, the bigger the inflection on the other end. In many ways, mm -hmm. my wife and I understood this concept when we were, you know, relatively pretty young at the time and young adults. And, and both, you know, for her, it was senior healthcare, And she was really, really passionate about this. And for me, it was education. And so in many ways, we both were supporting each other through that dip in different ways. And so it's a life partner. And I, and I was very, very lucky uh, mm -hmm. that I you know, met her and managed to go through that with her. So she was supportive. My parents were supportive. And I don't think they needed to be, but they were incredibly supportive. But I told my parents that a lot of people, relatives and others might not understand what I'm doing. I'm going to be gone. They're going to be like, a, there's going to be a lot of confusion as to what I'm doing. And I'm going to look crazy even to you because people are going to tell you I'm crazy. And um, you won't understand this. And, and, they, and I know this because apparently my, my parents have told me this now. Like, you know, you, you said this to me. You said this to me years ago. And because I had connected the dots when I left Microsoft. And of like, there's a process. I don't know what it's, comes out at the end. And that's mm -hmm. part of the process. But I know if I continue this, but I'll find my passion. I'll find a way to make a living out of my passion and be able to do all the other things I want to do. But it's going to take five to 10 years. And I'm preparing for this long distance marathon yeah and, um, that is literally what it looked like and my wife was a big part of it and I used to talk to her about okay so right now I'm not on payroll you know and uh, I think by this milestone over here 
I might actually be able to get on payroll. And then it was like, okay, now I'm on payroll. And I know those, there were a few months where I got off payroll, right? So I think by this milestone, I'll be able to do that and never, ever get off payroll again, right? And then it was, it was like, these are the little like milestones I hit. And if I couldn't do that, I'm, I'm, I'm giving up on this. Because, and so I would do things and I would, I try not to separate our own like personal, like um, savings. I, I, I raise capital across these milestones. I try to map it against the key milestones a company needs, needs to make. Um, I didn't want to, um, you know, you know, risk, you know, um, her having to suffer too much or anyone else around us. So I wanted to be able to make sure her career was unaffected by my career at the same time. So we try to hedge against that as much as we can financially. Um, but I remember just having these big milestones that I had to hit um, in the early days. And she just really um, supporting me through that. And I know that was not easy. And then, of course, yeah. her son was born and stuff. So, so that's, that's uh, what I mean by this is not something, even now, I can understand what Elon is saying and I'm sure many entrepreneurs feel this way. It's not something you want to envy even now. Yeah. And it's not something having gone through this, I had this like, oh, if I can do it, anyone can do it. And I want to prove that I can do it. And therefore I can prove anyone good. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. I got here and I realized a couple of things. <laughs> yes. Everyone does have the mental capacity to do it. Right. But life may not give all the, other things that are outside your control to be able to pursue that mental, uh, to, to demonstrate your mental capacity to do it. So I think everyone, a lot of people, if not everyone, most people can actually go through this journey. Our brain was wired to be able to handle this, but there are other things that affect one's life. So I don't, I wouldn't wish for anybody to go through what I went through in terms of the suffering. Yeah. Um, but now I'm here. I'm, I'm more, you know, to be honest, I'm more excited about, like the people around me that I get to go to work with and watching them, you know, we're like a chain of startups at Nolichuk and, you know, and watching them essentially um, achieve like their business units, like product market fit and like, you know, and like just seeing how they start pioneering these really cool um, business units and taking it to the next level. And for me, I get excited watching how many people we can, you know, really help find that connection between, mm -hmm. you know, their calling and this and, and having that support system to be able to um, uh, bring that out of them. So that's, to me, that's more fun than my actual role itself. Yeah, man. Like uh, you gave us a lot to digest there, but one of the things that I really want to point out is how well read you are when it comes to like personal development management and, and, and like, especially personal development side. Uh, one thing that uh, we talked about two years ago on that call I referenced earlier, you brought up this idea that I still quote on this podcast, like almost on every episode. And it's the idea of, you know, as an entrepreneur, are you a visionary or are you an operator? Right. Like entrepreneurs kind of fall in the spectrum where a visionary, you know, they see this mountaintop, the, the possibility of what could be that their idea is so great. It haunts them and, you know, you know, and it pull and it's like a pull factor. It pulls them no matter where they are in life. Whereas an operator, they're more systematic. You know, they have uh, like, you know, things under their belt uh, in their, they're, they're built and developed. And now that takes and propels them into like a, a almost like an operation into, into develop what they are. And generally, if you, if you're an outlier, you're kind of forced to come into the, in the middle, in the between yeah. of this you know, visionaries that yeah. become, have to force to become operators, operators are forced to develop vision or to find co-founders who can fill that gap. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, you want, let's, can you break that down for us? You know? yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think I was probably naturally a visionary mm -hmm. where my sisters could tell you all the failed projects they saw me do in the schoolyard. Uh, you know, all these clubs and, you know, <laughs> rockets that were going to go to the moon. Literally, I thought it was going to go to the moon. So I clearly had a vision. Oh, the gifted kids got that rocket above the school. All right. This one's going to the moon. Started mm -hmm. reading about rocket propellant and, you know, from the library and it's like, we're going to take this. I think, uh, I think this is possible. So just how silly was that? Like I was really young, but so visionary uh, in the sense that, you know, I did have these creative images of what I think we could do. And then obviously, like you said, when you fail, you slowly start to realize the details 
right, mm -hmm. as to why you failed. And so um, I would say the book period that, you know, when we ran into, even, even then, like, um, I might have even, like, at some point in my journey, maybe even, like, been 80% just just buried in, in other people's thoughts and, you know, um, books and other knowledge and in mentorship and everything, just soaking it in still, still, still. I, I think I got it got to a point where I a, a bit overclubbed it and I forgot my own uh, intuition on things. I had an investor slash mentor. Uh, one night he told me, he's like, you know, we were just, I was at his place and, you know, pulled me aside at the party and said, you know, like, you can put the books down in his own <laughs> words. Like he said, it, I can't remember exactly, I'm paraphrasing right now. And he's like, you're actually at a point where you can just work off your intuition. Mm -hmm. And he said this thing. And I just remember that like, I had this scap, like, a, you know, like a, what felt like a bridge and scaffolding around the bridge, but a ton of scaffolding around the bridge. And that moment just feeling, <laughs> I don't know why, but feeling like I saw the scaffolding fall down. I saw the bridge was still up. You know, and I remember this feeling of like leaving that and just, you know, and every time I had this like instance where it's like I wanted to make a decision, I wanted to explore something. It's like, okay, let me go find a book. Let me go find and talk to someone and saying, you know, wait, hold on. What does my intuition tell me? And uh, holy shit, I started doing that, you know, one after the other after the other. And what I realized was um, I had maybe I developed a total like a, a number of schemas through books and other, other means and had uh, accumulated quite a bit of information about what a business looks like. And I was able to kind of just kind of filter down and, 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 and rely on intuition to figure out at this point, this is what I need to do right now. Mm. And I think I wouldn't have gotten there if I didn't do that imposter syndrome um, and, and, and even, and I think the imposter syndrome helped me to go pursue information elsewhere. I think I wouldn't have gotten to that place if I didn't read all the books that I did or talk to or analyze all these things. But I also, at the same time, I'm not saying that you should just completely, you know, go on intuition, but I'm also saying not to just go on other people's thoughts at some point. Um, you know, it's gonna, you're gonna have your own thoughts that sort of stand on top of, like stand on the shoulders of all this other prior work. Yeah. And in order to look into the future, you can't build based on the past. And I think I call that mentor, like my last mentor. Because <laughs> um, I, I, now I don't even use that word anymore for me. Hmm. Um, but um, yeah, and that's the, I sent you a link about the allegory of the cave. Yes, I, I think I I realized, that. Yeah, so what I realized was books are – so let, let, me, let me take a step back. Let's go a little deep now. Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about a few things, and you'll sort of see it kind of arrives to my, 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 my view on this. So first of all, you know, humans, like what sets us apart from all other creatures? Uh, you would think, oh, it's, you know, tools. We build tools or um, – but, you know, beavers build tools. Birds build nests, right? So, like, it's not that we build tools. Uh, octopuses can reason, and dolphins, their brains just as big, or not bigger than ours. Others can communicate too. If you go through every single thing a human does, you know, you will find an animal that actually does. There was, a, there was a. This is not my information. It's a documentary that I watched, and I, it was quite fascinating that they couldn't find a single one. I think the one thing that sets us apart is the probabilities of us being able to contribute to the tool set to problem solve is much higher than any other species ever before us or to this day on earth. And I think, um, so it's our problem solving ability, but you don't see a nest, you know, improving. You don't see a bird, you know, wearing a turtleneck saying, this is nest 2.0 and yeah. right. And it's, <laughs> there's no constant improvement but that's one of the key things that humans have that sets us apart from all other species. The ability to contribute, to, to reason, to problem solve at a higher clip rate at a much more frequent. But I don't think we use that often enough. That, you know, the average human being works off of their long-term memory, works off of, you know, essentially routine, uh, you know, the, the actual working memory, which is the memory that you need to reason new things, is extremely small. And 
uh, for every one of us and uh, in many ways painful to, to have to use. You get exhausted. You actually fall asleep. You know, when you go to um, a new place, uh, travel to a new city, you know, why do we get tired by the end of the day? Because there was just way too much information. Everything changed. That's the working memory on overdrive. Mm -hmm. When you learn to drive for the first time, you're not multitasking. You're just focused like this, you know, and you just, you know, first time you try to do a three point park, uh, it's, it's the same thing. You're just super nervous. Why? Because it's all working memory. Now you do this in your sleep, practically. You're on autopilot. That's in your long-term memory. So the working memory is really small and very hard to process. But we have, ironically, the best working memory of all species on planet Earth. So our ability, to, allowing us to, everyone contributing to this sort of improvement of the tool set. But that's not to say that everyone actually does this. In fact, I would argue that a very small population does, you know, has been able to unlock what exists in every one of our brains um, to a high degree. And the, perhaps the, the biggest example today uh, is Elon Musk. And then there's gradients of problem solvers in every field, in every company, in every place. And, it, you know, the opportunity, if you can find, activate that, and you know, basically what you talked about, Ravi, right, which is this idea of curiosity and and, and venturing and reasoning and trying new things like that process you've basically unlocked the a single thing that separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom mm -hmm. why am i saying this where is this going to so let's go back 200,000 years that's when our biological existence apparently um, occurred humans homo sapiens um, at some point we actually started to communicate apparently i think it was a prop roughly around 25,000 years ago so what would that have experience been like? Um, I, I, I started digging it up and I found some obscure YouTube video that I think had like a thousand views or something by an anthropologist describing what that phenomenon might have felt like for folks who were living during that transition where the human word was starting to develop and people had symbolic representations through the sounds that we were able to control mm -hmm. like parrots, right? And um, he said it was probably like what, you know, similar to what it's like when you first arrive to New York City and you see the lights hustle and the activeness at night, all, you know, at, at night we were these the species that were mostly falling asleep. And if you had to communicate, it was just like touch and thuds and grunts. And all of a sudden now you can tell stories and you can communicate, you can sing. Um, so around 25,000 years ago, we started to introduce language and it was probably, I would argue, the first tool most like the first groundbreaking tool, the first programming language, in fact, where we were codifying the end of speakers were the first programmers, anyone who contributing to the, you know, the dictionary at the time. Mm -hmm. So Inventing the spoken words, it's like a ultimate measure of intelligence at a point, right? What's that? In inventing words, inventing yeah. vocabulary. They were right? the engineers, mm -hmm. the scientists, they were the inventing the word itself was exactly the pioneering thing to do at the time. Um, and creating that tool set. But they are, make no mistake, the first tool on a long stack of tools that everything sits on top of. If you think of all of humans, human tools, I've, I, looked, I like to think of it as like a tool stack. Mm -hmm. and at the foundation, you had the human word, the spoken word and the written word and language, right? And so, you know, we've, since for 25,000 years, we've seen incredible progress and you've seen sort of an exponential growth curve. And we've come up with incredible tools that sit on top of that tool, right? And civilization started like 5,000 years ago. So it took us a while to go from hunter-gatherer to like, hey, let's all just do one specialized task and create a currency of trust among these clusters of groups and, and uh, create a system of morality, social morality that allows us to penalize anyone who try to break and violate the system and create these efficiencies to coordinate and, and and ultimately that gave us more time to do recreational things and created you know you know other breakthroughs when you start specializing so all this really cool stuff started happening only five thousand years so even though language started twenty five thousand years you know civilizations are five thousand years and but more and more tools started to like you know layer up so then you got this thing like okay so now you have you know all kinds of things from agriculture irrigation domestication of animals you know, um, the sewer systems, you know, um, 
democracy, rule of law, governance, all these, you know, systems and tools that sit on top of each other and incredible breakthroughs. Democracy, probably some of the first ideas weren't as complex as the ideas we try to push through policy today. Problems weren't as complex and were, you know, the spoken word and the debate was an incredible and effective way to, you know, communicate, convey and pass concepts from one, st- one mind to another. Things got really, really complex since then. And we, you know, the human word is a linear, you know, a linear, uh, um, what's the right way of describing it? When you read something, it's just like, it's a very linear thing. And some of these ideas are like multidimensional, mm. you know, it's like a car engine. If you've never seen a car engine before and you were tasked to build it and you've never seen it and someone gave you a book, a string of words to describe what a car engine is, you might be able to grasp the silhouette of a car engine, but not truly know how to rep build a car engine. Yeah. Right. But if you had, but if this car engine, you know, if you had nothing to, and you had to go build one and you had nothing to even help you get started, you might pick every book you can get your hands on to, you know, that comes remotely close to describing this sophisticated thing. Right. And to me, that's what books were for business. Mm. And so I had this, you know, you know, this, when we were kids, we played this thing called broken telephone, right? Where you say something and then someone else hears something else and then it goes on. And by the time it gets to the other person, it's like, oh my God, completely different. But that break, breaking of communication happens just from one person to another, just within one degree, right? And so books have that risk as well. So I thought, okay, what if I got every thinker on this a topic that I want to learn? sitting around the campfire with me in the middle and each one takes their turn to explain what it is this thing in the middle is and what if i just read their book read it again read it again and read it again watch their blogs read their blogs watch their interviews get everything i can get if i admire that person i think they have uh figured out the key or a big component of what i want to learn I'm going to just absorb, absorb, you know, like absorb everything I can from that, you know, person until I can almost feel like that person's in my head. And when I'm thinking I can hear them, I can actually talk to them and they can guide me in what, what, what's in front of me based on what they have written about and what they have said in on that's available online or anywhere. So I had said, okay, well, if I can guide four or five different people on a topic that I can peg in, that person has been through this or can, you know, actually understand how to build this car engine, this complicated thing. I'm trying to understand. And if I can get a few folks like that and then go through this really rigorous process, um, I'll have them in my head. And I think that was inspired by, um, I think it was in the biography for Abraham Lincoln, where he read, uh, when he liked a book, he read it to the, so many times that at t- when he would meet the author, like he, it, it was very clear that he knew the book better than the author at the time. Or so mm-hmm. this idea of just really, you know, he can't afford these people to have, he can't afford to have all these mentors around you. If you can do this process, so I I would judge like I would base it on the person, and what I and me sizing up like you know would it be great to have this guy as a mentor or girl as a mentor, and then if I the answer is yes based on a you know my you know what they're talking about what I think they seem to know and they're struggling to explain or um, written about and then I basically try to find everything I can about it, and so that's been my process and. And then after that process, I still know all I have is but a shadow hmm. of what reality is. Yeah. And when, you know, the same mentor who basically told me to stop the books that night, he showed me that video, the allegory of the cave. And um, he told me about it. And I went and looked it up. And that's the video I sent you that resonated with me. Um, because in many ways, like not just you know, us and in our respective journeys, but even Plato, um, you know, certain parts of his understanding of the world and his grasp of how the world works arguably were, are just shadows. Whereas, you know, in his specific unique journey that he took out the cave, he is, you know, distinguished reality from the shadows and he's a level above us all. Um, but a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of our understanding of the world, arguably, is just shadows and not the real object. And, and I think that's um, 
uh, you know, if, if there's one wish I had for everyone is can we start, like I, I, what I'm still continuing to do is to sort of make my way out of one of the many entrances and exits in the cave in a, a specific domain. And I, and I would argue that everyone who's ever, you know, pursuing some mastery, they'll never like see all reality, but they're you know, a, for, a version of reality for which they've achieved mastery in and everything else might, they're just is in the cave as everyone else. That's kind of my interpretation of that whole thing. And absolutely. This is really interesting because I think we, I, I love that story as well, but I think we interpreted it two different ways. Um, you, can, you seem to see it as a way of like, you know, you're trying to escape uh, the subset you've been put into, right? Trying to get knowledge from other people to be like, oh, how can I leave this cave and see what else I'm capable of doing? Whereas I see it as like the, almost the other way around, right? So, you know, I talked earlier about like, you know, proficiency for reading and like my, my curiosity, intense curiosity as a kid to, like, to learn. My biggest problem, just to just jump in here about this, was like communication. So me doing this podcast is actually going full circle because as a kid, I was the one that if you asked a question, couldn't string words together to like communicate, even though I knew it up here. Right. I mean, I was the one that, you know, in the friend circle, you know, one guy is like telling jokes, other one's telling stories, other person is like freestyling. I'll be the one who's like quiet, you know, just laughing along. Cause like, I don't, I don't know how to participate. And it, to me, the biggest, the biggest miracle for me was YouTube. Yeah. Because I would, you know, read all these books and all these kind of things and understand all this knowledge, but I couldn't bring it back out there. But through YouTube, I could literally bring up like all these speakers, like great orators, right? Even the authors of the books themselves talking about it, but just see how they string ideas along and communicate. Yeah. It's funny because you read their book and then you hear them talk and each time they talk, it's like they're describing the car engine, but they use different metaphors or they come at the same thing different ways. Mm -hmm. and, and every step of the way you get a closer image of what uh, what they're what they have in what model is in their head i guess sorry keep going but yeah yeah so to the allegory of the cave i always felt like you know i was a guy who's like from outside the cave founding finding everybody else looking at the shadows and i'm like trying to tell them about the outside but didn't have the language to communicate in the way that everyone else was communicating it or understood because i always felt like i was like you know, misunderstood or like not, not being, not being understood because I was speaking a different language, but I wasn't even speaking, you know, like that was, that was the main problem. And the miracle of YouTube, right? Think about it. Like, like what we're doing right now is going to go up on YouTube. We have now everything we've said recorded like in, in the best format possible, right? Like they say a picture is worth a, a thousand words. Well, video is like a novel, Right. We have now this hour long plus episode of us talking about our ideas while, you know, our, our, our hand motions are there, our facial expressions are there, you know, how, like, you know, how we perceive things are there. And that's now being preserved in perpetuity. Right. And talking about Plato, Aristotle, you know, talking about the, the Greeks, like, had this great quote about writing. He's like, when the Greeks adopted writing, because they weren't the first, uh, many cultures had writing way before them, before, before the Euro Europeans, before yeah. migrated to Europe. When the Greeks adopted writing, uh, Aristotle called it evil. He's like, this is going to make people dumb. Because prior to the written word, it was an oral tradition of passing information down, where you would practice speaking uh, speeches, poems, especially like, you know, in rhymes. You would, uh, you would practice orating that with the, with, the, with the mentor, with the teacher, over and over again until it becomes internalized and you can repeat it. So they can handle more complex objects. Right. It's like, it's like before cell phones, like how many right. numbers did you know? Right. Some people would know a bunch, like, you know, it can name like a hundred numbers, but most people can name about five numbers and few people will struggle to remember even one number. Right. right. What books did was equalize knowledge, but he was afraid. And many of the Greeks shared the sentiment that the technology of books was going to make people dumb because they would lose the ability or the need to remember things in long form. And because of that, they would rely on the external device. They, they would rely on this external device to provide them the knowledge, right? And it brings back this interesting idea is that technology is what makes us human, right? Like when we've invented fire, what we lost was the ability to process uncooked meat, right? It changed us physically. Like we were able to extract a higher calorie count per, per meal, but because of that, we lost the bacteria that can digest, uh, like, you know, unprocessed meat, uh, uncooked meat, right? It changes biologically, allows us to feed like, a bigger brain and evolve more, but it biologically changed with us. And same thing, books changed us, 
YouTube has changed us, right? The technology solutions of the day is what makes us human. So there's always a population, percentage of population, they know it's pros and cons, right? People are like, oh, look what we're going to lose, but also look what we seek to gain. And I remember having this talk with my dad, um, you know, when he flipped through my university textbooks in first year. And he saw these like beautiful illustrations, you know, 3D models in, in 2D about, you know, molecules and you know, organic chemistry and how it all works. And he was like, he was kind of like taken back and he was kind of like, you know, almost like an angst. He's like, you know, back in the day when we were reading this, we, we had no pictures, right? All our textbooks were just like, it's words. And I could never, he's, he's an artist, he's, he's a visual person. And he could never get around that because the, the words never, he could never pick it up. And he's like, if only if I had this, you know, maybe I could have, you know, this visual art, like I could resonate, I, I would have understood things much better and grasped it. It's like, you are lucky. And I remember turning to him and saying, well, when my kids have VR goggles they can put on and see these molecules in three dimensions and can turn them and see how they all fit together and how the bigger whole happens and how the universe works and all that stuff in live dimensions, I'm also going to look at them and be like, look how lucky you are. I think in complex matters that these 2D pictures does not, does not compute in the, in the, you know, the three-dimensional, fourth-dimensional protein folding that requires to understand how biology works. It's too limiting. Look how, look how interested you are, right? So look how privileged you are. So the act of technology is changing us, and that technology is what makes us human. What I'm really interested in is you know, sharing your sentiment is how technology being, uh, being employed in the workspace and education in different, in different environments, how that's gonna progressively morph us as a species. That's a great question. And, that's, and you touched on some things that resonate with my understanding as well. Um, you know, you just, if the big question was around tech. So there's this one side note. Uh, this, the second half of the allegory of the cave is going back into the cave and trying to explain and sounding like the village idiot in some ways or a crazy man, right? And I think, um, I think that's that analogy of the allegory of the cave does a really good job of explaining what happens when you become an analyzer of shadows versus one who actually casts the shadows, the out, see the reality of um, the thing that you're, you know, achieving mastery for. And I think that uh, sec, you know, you mentioned that our our interpretation is different. I actually don't think so. I, I struggled with the second half as well. Okay. I wanted to go back and try to explain like, this is how you, this is what I learned. And, and mm. I think two years ago, you probably got my version of my supercharged version of like, Hey, this is what I'm reading. This is what I'm doing. This is what you should be thinking about. Yada, yada, yada. It's, and uh, now I'm a lot more calm about these things and paced, you know, mm -hmm. and trying to figure out like what makes sense where, but so that, that is a challenge when you achieve mastery at something, you see uh, what, when you, when you can actually wield the thing that you've achieved mastery and you can sort of improve on it, make it better for the world, you start dabble in the edge of human contribution. You start to, you're, you're playing with the, the real object versus the casting the shadow. But when we analyze it from outside, it's, it, it is often the shadow. And I think um, it causes this weird situation where um, it's hard to explain and how you, you're doing that and when you do try to do it, it, it just looks silly. Um, I think that's what you're kind of kind of getting at there as well. And I think that I totally, that, that, that's definitely resonates with me. So talking about tech, so talking about something you said, so, so you have this human language and your play, uh, your Greek um, example with the Pl Plato or Aristotle, whoever was afraid Aristotle. of the word coming in, that makes a ton of sense um, with, as it relates to the written word versus the idea of this, the, the Socratic method of passing down, like meant like one-on-one -on -one education, you know, and getting people to share their thinking and, you know, that back and forth process of teaching, um, re writing, reading from a book is you can never like mentorship or one-on-one -on -one hands down, like, you know, conversation and the and knowledge transfer to that is far more superior than reading from a book. Ideally, you want the author in front of you. So I think that that resonates with me and actually has interesting connections to even with ed tech and other layers that kind of contribute to both uh, making things more equitable, but also having limitations. And that speaks to all tools. Um, so I think that we've been like, um, people confuse or don't know, like one great insight that I had um, to figure out 
to help me sort of extrapolate where, where, we, where we might go in terms of the future is looking at the transition between tools, right? And so why I was looking up for that like obscure video of what would have life been like before the spoken word and then during the spoken word, that transition and after was to understand what was given up, right? In, ter in terms of, um, you know, before this thing showed up and then what was the world after? And, um, and I think that, you know, your example of one of the great philosophers freaking out when books were arriving was another great example of people knowing what was about to be lost in the mm -hmm. process of this transition. Um, and often tools do that. Like people assume like, oh, when a new tool is adopted, you know, it must be adopted because it's better in every which way, but actually something's being given up. There's a, it's a net net benefit to the larger society, but something there's a trade-off often. And what I find those trade-offs can actually be a good indicator of what is yet to be improved on. Like that makes way for an opportunity down the line for another tool to come in and fix that. So a great example of this is the gramophone. So there's a TED talk about this when the gramophone arrived, I think either in the UK or yeah, I believe it was the UK. Um, apparently there was this guy who tried to warn them like, don't let this thing arrive. It's gonna kill every art form, all the street artists are going to disappear off the streets because you're going to be in your living rooms listening through this, you know, uh, this one recording from this one building or a few buildings that control all the flow of art, right? And so don't bring this thing. It's going to kill creativity. And it did mm -hmm. in many ways because, you know, I lived, I was probably one of the last few generations who would not even dare come online like this and create their own YouTube video. Or, you know, if you, I played the guitar for a little while and that was considered a talent just because I played the guitar. And that's laughable in the YouTube era because anyone can play the guitar if they wanted to, right? So in many ways, like something that was dormant, this trade-off that we gave up from the early, you know, arrival of the, the gramophone, right? The, the, the first radio uh, recording device, um, you know, we finally got back through YouTube, right? And now street artists are not only street artists, like but they have a global audience so you can still get as many people as you might organize in a street if you're like the average person a thousand views mm -hmm. but that is the equivalent of what um you know they had uh years ago that was lost and for generations we were just consumers of content and now we can be producers again and mm -hmm. so it's like a new renaissance coming back so like tools have this weird sort of thing facebook is a great one where a lot of people, if you go back to the time when Facebook was taking off and social media was taking off, people are com commenting on how privacy and your sense of privacy was getting lost, right? And But it was a really great example of one where, you know, the opening and the fix for that solution to, as it relates to social media was Snapchat in some ways, where they created this medium where you get, you know, your posts disappear. And I think like, Sometimes you can use these sort of trade-offs. You go back and look at those transitions and see what was given up. It teaches you a little bit more of like what, what it is that this nuance is and what it isn't. The arbitrary design decisions, the parts of it that are, don't have to be that way. Uh, Brian Chesky with Airbnb said, you know, um, nobody wanted to invest in us. We had like two bookings a month. And uh, um, the big, you know, the, the constant like, feedback we had was, you know, um, oh, you know, like nobody's going to want to let a stranger in their house or uh, why would you want to live in a stranger's house? That's just crazy. But, it, but he said that, but I remember my grandfather told me that, you know, when I told him about the idea, he's like, oh yeah, we used to have that. Bed and breakfast before the world war, we used to do that all the time. Yeah. It's like, and so, so it's kind of funny how the, you know, there's a lot of clues throughout history that way. And I think, so that's one characteristic um, that if you, you can apply, you know, there's first principles and there's the anthropology of like tools and like studying human behavior before, during the transition, after that gives you a ton of clues of where things are going to go or where they could go. Then there's this other one I saw where we're also diverging. So you might think we're converging in tools, but I actually think we're diverging. Tools generally um, like, a, like a, a branch on a tree spread. And um, I think what I, 
what I mean by this is instead of like having the Swiss army knife, like everything just becoming one thing, it's actually the opposite. We're getting highly specialized. Like, I don't know if you have a kid at all, but, yeah. uh, you know, my wife, the number of things that mothers have for newborns that have, you know, shown, you know, popped up in the last 10 years is just absolutely remarkable. And I, I, have, a, I have a baby sister who's 10 years younger than me. So I watched her grow up. I don't remember any of those things available for, for my mom. And so like, there's a ton of highly specialized tools for all these like odd use cases that are just in the moment, super helpful at that moment. And, and just the number of tools that like we've built, the number of, um, you know, you know, micro edge cases and businesses that must have spawned out in those categories, I think this is remarkable. Um, the Ford Model T replaced horses for the most part, we still have horses. So it's not even like it's gone, but you know, that one size fits all car eventually spawn into so many subcategories, right? So there's these weird phenomena, like it starts to branch out and then maybe some tectonic shift, underlying tectonic shift causes a situation where, um, you know, like the Tesla situation where there's a huge step function or, of improvement. And then that one company, you know, takes everything to the to a new category so the, the entire branch is clipped and now that one company owns it but eventually it's what that will with, with electric cars autonomous driving you're going to see segments again you're going to see branches out again and um yeah like so i think like in terms of like the way i like i do like this conversation this this, this idea of like asking this question is a great one because it's like where do you see tools and, and where do you think things are going and there's a ton of interesting characteristics like this that I see, and a third one is, um, you know, with um, the way I like to categorize um, the evolution of um, tools um, or things that sort of cause um, or progress. You got scientists, right? R and D. You got research, and even underpinning that is philosophy and other things. But you have sciences, and you have folks in lab coats just pioneering on the edge of human knowledge, right? And they do this across you know, inanimate and biological things. So, and I use biological because even like, you know, psychology, organizational behavior, that is, you know, there's science behind that as well. But you got a lot of interesting stuff happening um, on the academic side of things, the theory and, and whatnot. Then you have engineering, hmm. right? And that's where things get interesting in terms of knowing how close we are to applying the sciences that were just discovered when engineers start playing around with this stuff to see if there's an application or there, when there's an engineering degree on something, you know, we've hit, you know, there is all an application has been found, right? And now it's about commercializing it and, and new emerging industries, you know, are, are coming out of it. Um, so that that's kind of the next phase. And then what ends up happening is the, I call it like the technician phase, the mechanic, the electrician, um, so a great example would be, you know, Faraday during the, uh, the early enlightenment period of, uh, for, the, for electricity, Faraday and a few great physicists and scientists, you know, pioneered an understanding of electricity and magnetism. Brilliant stuff. That guy wasn't, you know, a very poor guy. Like he came from a yeah. poor family. The Sciences Society did not welcome him. Highly, you know, like you, like you described your dad, a visual person could see things, you couldn't explain it, but could see things faster than all the elite scientists in the, in the room and often uh, to their jealousy and envy. Um, anyway, he, he was one of the key fathers of, you know, everything that's powering our world today. And uh, Tesla, um, I would argue, would, was more an engineer. Um, Which part of that value chain interests you the most? The R&D, the engineering, the... Uh application technician? When I was growing up, the one that like I was exposed to the most was the inventors, the black and white pictures of the Wright brothers mm. and Thomas Edison. But I think at Waterloo, I got exposed to entrepreneurship. The thing about the inventors back then was I think this they were inventing, but they were also kind of, an in, they were also innovators. Like maybe that's, and I think when I look back, the Wright brothers were inventors, but they were innovators as well. So they didn't necessarily invent a new science. 
So they were, I think they call them inventors, but they were innovators, right? And, and uh, innovation is a lot more than simply like, so the, I, yeah, I, innovation, it, like hands down for me, the answer is innovation. But what I saw back then, like what I, the way I look at this is you got the scientists, you got the theoretical inventors coming up with new concepts, the Nobel laureates. Then you have the applied sciences, the application of it, bringing it to market, like actually pushing the envelope in human progress, um, which I think um, is still needs, there's a lot of work to be done to demystify that process because I think it, it sounds um, magical or sounds like dumb luck or sounds, it's just grossly misunderstood in many ways. Uh, but it's also the anyone, and sometimes it's even blasphemous to talk about it. Like, you know, a little bit about it, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, how dare you think you can like, you know, compare yourself to this or that. And there's all these weird um, behavior, like a uh, cultural norms around these topics, which need to be broken. And I think in the next 50 years, that is going to happen. And I think you can attribute that mostly to this guy named Steve Blank, who uh, wrote the, um, the Four Steps to Epiphany. A student of his was Eric Ries, who wrote Lean Startup. And what they've done is set sort of uh, the beginning of what will be uh, considered equivalent to what Peter Drucker did for you know modern management in the 50s. And this idea, you know, and 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 so there's these there's these moments where someone finds a way to articulate um, something in a way that just just catches on, right? And and people can build on. And those two guys did that. Mm -hmm. And I think this 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 idea of innovation, entrepreneurship, serial entrepreneurs will get demystified. Because I remember, um, you know, some of the investors that didn't, that I actually won that I turned down was a, also a mentor for a little while for me. Um, you know, I would reference, you know, something I learned from Steve Jobs, right? And he was, you know, not everyone can be Steve Jobs. I never said that. <laughs> but like this, there's this weird like um, thing around, um, you know, there's these people that we put on a pedestal, right? It's so frustrating for me, actually, when I see people do this. And it's not frustrating for me personally, but frustrating for all the people that get fooled by that way of thinking and then dismiss an opportunity to grow for themselves, hmm. right? And the opportunity they block for so many other people who could have learned a few things from these guys. Maybe it was because I was a magician at a young age where when all the kids, when I was, I, I was a magician, um, I'm bouncing around a few topics here. I'll mm -hmm. come back to this. But when I was a magician at 11 where I had a business card I printed out from Staples and I was getting paid 15 bucks, 15 bucks in my first show. My second show was 30 bucks and then, mm -hmm. You know, this is at 11, so this is a big deal. And was it the first, like, business? Was it the first enterprise? I think it uh, – well, I had some others, but the okay. magic show stuck with me for some time. But I remember being in the audience for my first magic show when I was 9 or 10, and I remember just then going to the library, reading books, and trying to do it. I remember just going to the back – like, back, like backstage to talk to the magician to see what was behind the curtain and to talk mm -hmm. to him and see if I could learn this stuff. And I just remember, like – you know, I think when I looked at the magician, I didn't look at it, look at him the way I guess the average nine-year-old might have looked at the magician. I looked at it as wanting to see if I can do that, hmm. right? This not just I want to catch him, but I want to do that. I want to understand how you do that, and um, that gave me the opportunity to then you know, and that was a grown adult doing making a living, fooling people, right? <laughs> Wielding like sciences and psychology and creating this dramatic experience that just, you know, gave people smiles and awe, right? And so it, this was a, it was an, it was a feel good feeling that he was imparting in the room and for their one weekend party and uh, kids and parents were happy and laughing and, and in awe and suspended, dis suspended disbelief. And I knew it was harnessing the power of physics and psychology behind the, you know, to do this. So this was this, this massive thing that I just wanted to be able to do. Right. And so um, I read the books and all stuff. And maybe, you know, when I started to read about Steve Jobs and all these folks, yeah, they kind of look like magicians too, mm -hmm. to us. And they put them on a pedestal. And I don't know which of the three philosophers, because I know I picked up these books very early on at Microsoft, Aristotle. And 
I don't know which, a lot of that, <laughs> to use the common phrase, sounded Greek to me. Like a lot of that stuff went over my head. But there was this one phrase um, where he talked about if, um, if, if a person achieves something truly great, you know, that could be related to luck and other circumstances, could be related to their skill. So it's hard to say. But if they do it more than once, there's something about that person you might want to pay closer attention to. And, you know, I just, that stuck with me, right? I'm paraphrasing, but it stuck with me. And it's when I started seeing this, you know, serial entrepreneurs, Gandhi, the number of chess moves he made, um, you know, to, to make an impact, you know, if it, if it was just one, right time, right place, rose to the challenge. But there was a series of things he did that instilled change, along with being at the right time, right place. So there was clearly something the dude knew, right, in how to be able to, you know, act change. And um, there was, you know, masterpieces by artists, music, and other, other mediums, inventors who invented multiple can you, things. Can you elaborate a little bit more on Gandhi? Because I, 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 the, the picture behind you, you know, you told me earlier your wife uh, drew a, a portrait of Gandhi, which is hanging behind you, clearly must be an important figure for you. Yeah, I was actually debating. I, I applied for a JD MBA. And if you look at the application, you wouldn't know if I was going to, I was looking to, you know, for a social activist cause to get behind. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and I was also like, I wasn't sure where I was going to go. So I was actually oscillating between maybe, you know, maybe I can do something back home. Uh, this was around 2009. I was doing a lot of volunteer work. I was like, you know, a lot of suffering going on back home. And, you know, I felt all like many immigrants felt guilty that, you know, we were the lucky ones. Right. And um, so I, I was actually <laughs> not sure where I was going to go, but I was inspired by Gandhi. I was inspired by um, Dr. King and Mandela and, and um, you know, the calculus back home is so different from the calculus of those three people, what mm. they, the situation was so different, but I genuinely dove into a lot of material and tried to understand if not me like is there hope for significant social you know change back home so that um, i would literally call my wife at the time girlfriend from barnes and noble and say okay so i learned this and i learned this and well i don't know if this is actually and she would just kind of nod and smile and i i, I should ask her what she must have thought back then but um that was uh gandhi so gandhi i could you know man I can keep going, so I got I got time today. Yeah, but uh, Gandhi. I'll take uh, it. <laughs> you know, there is some impressive stuff uh, that he did uh, when he was in Africa. Uh, obviously, one of his first milestones was you know the burning of the passes, and you know Edward Bernays, the father of PR. I mean, I'm not sure if they they lived around the same. I think they did actually. Um, he wrote a lot about 1920s. Wrote a lot yeah. about this the, the application of um, um, I guess manufacturing news, right? For the purpose of what you're trying to achieve and to, to you know, um, Gandhi was really, uh, um, had mastered this, but I think part of the, the calculus where there, this is the dumb luck part, right? Like he was, from what I understand, a terrible lawyer, um, got kicked out of his first court room because he was just scared to talk or was stuttering or whatnot. Um, couldn't find a job uh, in India. <laughs> big mm. place. And um, so I had to, you know, go where I guess there was demand for an Indian lawyer by another Indian in Africa. I'm guessing there was not a lot of competition for that job um, in Africa, looking, for, you know, where an Indian was looking for another Indian lawyer, um, went over there and essentially, um, you know, found himself at the beginning of um, a, a, some really um, important moments where he discovered something about himself and discovered that he can instill change and found a cause to get behind. Um, you know, very, very inspirational. Uh, from what I understand, when he came back to India, um, you know, there were lots of people who were trying to contribute to independence from what I understand. But I think some of the calculus that worked in his favor in Africa, he decided to replicate um, you know, in India. Uh, I don't know 
how much of this was just intuition, just based on principle, and how much of it was calculated in the, the way that I look at things sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, or the way I look at his situation, at least. But, you know, a lot of the social activism happened in the main cities. And he went to the, the remote parts of India and lived there, where you would argue, uh, you know, it, it, shouldn't, it should be obvious when you think back, um, not the greatest British judges, the most qualified would be, you know, maintaining office in those remote villages. Some of the worst characters would have been, um, you know, put there maybe for punishment or maybe because they couldn't compete for the other places, right? Um, so in many ways, like that equation makes for a really interesting situation where you can now go to toe, toe to toe with some really uninformed, um, let's say judges and law enforcement. And if you can draw the media's attention to those locations, the calculus would be in your favor where the public who would be reading about your story, let's say in England and other places, could see the, um, the atrocities, the unfairness in a much more contrasted way when the judge is probably not the smartest judge in all of the British empire, right? Mm. I don't know that, these are small little things I noticed about the calculus in those situations, but also, um, and I'm not sure that he necessarily thought that, but I, he, I find that Gandhi went to the front lines to try to understand the situation as real as he could and I think, you know, in his spiritual journey, in his journey, that I think getting to the front lines and understanding the actual problem intimately, um, there's a lot of risk in that. There's a, it's, That's like a dip. And there's that's no right. guarantee that you're going to make a change. Yeah. And I think um, there's elements of what I just described that's pure dumb luck that, you know, now you're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with, you know, you're practicing, just like the Beatles was practicing in a basement for like thousands of songs, you're now practicing with the lower ranks of the the British Empire, hmm. right? Test the waters. Working your way up, and your narrative, and you're mastering this. Uh, and you know the when you want to express a relationship to the masses, right? Um, it's the stories and the things you do that are you know that show that you care that are, have symbolic value and symbolic And he understood symbolism so well, the salt march, the burning of clothes. He was able to create these things that he knew would not only achieve um, the, the goals that he wanted with the people of India, but also to, to be able to point out the economic relationship between those cotton clothes or the salt going over to like the, to create, those are like textbook Edward Bernays moves, hmm. right? You, uh, it's the it's it's innovation it's it's a pioneering move it's applied sciences in my in my opinion for for social activism king was a, a brilliant strategist arguably we need a king right now in the united states right another strategist like that. Talking martin luther king yeah he was a brilliant strategist and and an orator and like uh winston churchill was constantly iterating on his speech. travis could you could you give me yeah. one sec hey I've been uh, sipping on Arizona iced tea uh, <laughs> that ran right through me. No problem. Yeah. But um, just going back to what you were talking about, like, I, I really enjoyed this uh, idea of, like, studying these, uh, these leaders for their strategy. You know, for me, uh, you know, Martin no, Luther King. Is one of it. It's not just strategy, but, like, but definitely strategy and other things as well. But you're right. Studying mm -hmm. leaders and, you know, pioneers. Yeah. And for me, I got caught up in like the oratory capabilities of these leaders, you know, the speeches they gave, you know, how they galvanized a crowd, a nation, you know, brought attention to a cause. Like, uh, like you know, what really captured me the power of language and words and how that's been utilized. But, you know, for, uh, for what it sounds like for you, right, the ability to strategize and think, you know, over a longer period of time, that, that really fascinated you, right? Like, that was the pattern. Yeah. Like, I, I, when I was leaving Marlou, like I, I did this intern at, at Bell and I thought, um, you know, I found my dream job, which is being a product manager where I can build something, um, which was like, I guess the next thing closest to an, being an entrepreneur, I suppose, in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had no, and I remember when I got to Waterloo, I remember saying, I want to be an inventor. 
um, which is probably another way of saying wanting to be an entrepreneur, at least in, in today's time, but in some ways. And so there's, there's relationships to that, but I, so I, I don't like what got my attention uh, with uh, all these guys was and the, and the long, the long battle, like the marathon idea was that I kept kind of, I, I think I hit midlife crisis at 25 uh, because I was working with adults um, at age seven, like as a paper boy, I, I've been around adults a lot. Uh, I just wanted to, like, I, I don't know how I found myself doing these odd jobs. I remember one aunt of mine telling my parents, like, why is he working? He's going to lose his childhood. And I'm like, I'm, my parents are not asking me to work. I, I want to do these things. These are fun. Right. And um, so I just remember, um, you know, really hitting home, but I, got, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of my life working. And I see these people that I'm, I'm running into who are spending the rest of their lives doing what they're doing. So it's really important to get this right. And, and I had this like moment where it's like, whoa, I think I found it. And then I go do it and I realize, oh, wait, it's not quite what I thought it would be. Right. I had that feeling at Microsoft and I was like, geez, like I, and, and for a guy who's done, worked across at that point, I had a pretty, you know, interesting resume where even before I got to Waterloo, I had a pretty long resume of experiences. Uh, and so getting there and going to the Waterloo and maximizing my time there at Waterloo, um, you know, and then coming out of it and working on my stuff, I thought I, I put a lot of thought into this. And then I showed up and I, and I turned down Apple and I put a lot of thought into why. Um, and I showed up at this thing and then I thought like, you know, I did the first thing and that was really fun. Then I realized that, oh my gosh, this product is done. All the exciting stuff was done years ago when they were first bringing out Microsoft Office. All, you know, that's when the, act, the, the action was up front. And so I, I thought I would, that, that's when, you know, when I started making the decision to leave and try to figure out where I want to go, that's when I can tell you, like, uh, you know, Saskia and I were, she, she would have, I, I, I'm sure she would describe it the same way. It was, it was, it was like a midlife crisis, uh, which you would normally hit around 50, I guess, and by the Harley Davidson, at least the traditional American narrative of midlife crisis and, and try to figure out what to do. I was hitting that early. So for me, it wasn't about, oh, I want to be, you know, these guys who do these, or girls who do these incredible things. Like Mother Teresa was another story that I followed very closely. Um, it was about like, you know, I really know my secret weapon is if I'm passionate and I'm being pushed to my up full potential, um, that'll bring the best out of me and I'll be the most productive in society. And in turn, I can provide a stable income for the people around me. Like I, if at the same time, if I wasn't passionate, it is also my curse. I won't be the most productive. And then I'll be a terrible role model if I was a father. And at the same time, I wouldn't be able to support my family if I wasn't, so I need to find my passion and I need to find something that I'm not gonna lose uh, my passion for in two years or three years or four years. And so I need, so the marathon uh, was basically the secret thing that said, okay, if I have no upper ceiling and if I could look at people who had no upper ceiling, you know, uh, to, as, a, as a role model to see where my ceiling is, Perhaps I could, and that's how I arrived to that sort of, you know, a, a ten, I need to do this. I need to, this journey needs to last at least 10 years in terms of trying to figure out where, where the upper limit is for my capability. And that's basically how I arrived. And then all these stories, you know, you know, um, showed all these other things that help you along the way. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or helps, but that's kind of how I started thinking about it, um, uh, you know. When I was read, at least even as I was reading it, it wasn't as if I had that answer up front. But as I was reading these biographies, I started to see that, you know, it has to be a marathon. That has to be one of the key components to pushing. But it wasn't. I wasn't reading it thinking, oh, okay, I'm gonna necessarily do that. Hmm. Or I can do that. But um, they were like goalposts that I didn't necessarily think I could hit. But I, I figured I find my. You know, I still don't know that I can ever hit to the greatness of these, you know, stories. And these are flawed human beings, they're not perfect, but they achieve greatness in one way, right? Um, 
I still don't know that, that I can or will. But just having uh, demystify their process, I'll well, know that if, I'll land somewhere where I'll never not be passionate and be the most productive person in society that I possibly can. Um, that's what, that was what the framework was for, for me personally. And that's why I think it's such a disservice to not talk about these people, to put them on a pedestal like they're mystical mm. gods or something. Um, but they're humans and they're very flawed human beings, right? In so many other ways. And, but they achieved something in this small niche area in their in human contribution that, you know, we're all proud of because it reflects back what humanity is capable of, what, what our, you know, society is capable of. So it's both, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting, but it's, 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 I, I think it's time to pull the curtain back in many ways, especially in our community. And, you know, some of the people that I remember who, who would make these weird comments about pro rough probabilities of things that are likely to happen, not happen, you know, um, I don't know. I just I can go into that later, but anyway, I I, I just think that uh, putting him on a pedestal does a disservice to us all. Yeah, I mean, going back to that, like, what is what does a goalpost look like to you, right? What is success? What is a, a claim? Like, you know, was it a, was it a, like predetermined for you? Do you have like something in your yeah, mind so, of what that means? Yeah, I, I even thought this through some weird. In this, I don't know how normal this is, um, but I did. I think we all kind of have these three types of, um, this, you know, ways that we want to be, feel connected to everything around us. So, you know, it's, it's our fear of loneliness and all that stuff. I think one of them, it's tied to, you know, wanting to be, you know, when you walk into a room, you kind of want to be connected with the people in your room. You want to fit in, you want to be loved, right, that sort of thing. And then there's this other one where you want to be admired by the people in the room. So not necessarily when you walk in the room, but when you leave the room, you hope that they admire you maybe. And, and all this could be driven by various childhood experiences that, you know, uh, might affect everyone. Then there's this other one around, like when you're dead, you know, and you're gone and you kind of want to be remembered. And I think everybody kind of, if you ask anyone, everyone, it'd be nice to have all three in some ways. It's just bearing it down to like the silly, like simple, what's kind of making you tick. I was, I just remember as a child, like looking at all these black and white photos of people who are, like you said, outliers or outcasts of the system, misfits who made these incredible impacts that we're so grateful for. Things that I was fascinated, inventing, building things, was fascinated by and remembering them and also remembering how scared I was of this concept of death. Um, and in many ways, how these people, I had an emotional relationship with these folks in some ways because they made they sparked an emotion that inspired me, right? Got me to want to, you know, the Wright Brothers story was like, as a kid, like it was just absolutely inspirational for me. So when I looked at sort of, even my time as a magician, the thing that got me the most excited was at the end of the show, a kid coming up and asking like, how do I become a magician? I was like, whoa, right? And I, because that was the closest feeling I had to, as a child, when I looked at these role models and, um, so I think I think I had to dis I, I made a decision right then and there, you know, when I was going on this marathon. I think the thing that makes would make me the least regretful of my life is to this this there's a um, something I read about Benjamin Franklin. I think about um, on his tombstone wanted to have like the the words useful to society engraved on his thing, and I was like that resonated, right? And I felt like okay, that resonated. And, and, you know, all these stories that inspired me at this point, I was like, oh man, if I could, if I could maybe also add to the fabric of stories that might inspire someone the way these guys inspired me, holy crap, that would be amazing. And that's, that's the goalpost. But I knew that no matter where I, if I just had something high enough as a, you know, you know, goalpost that no matter what, where I landed, I'll always have to, I'll be, I'll never lose my passion, which is the thing I need to be a productive member of society. That's the thing I, my passion to be productive. So as the goalpost is high enough and I can see a process to get, you know, move in that direction, as long as that's there, I think I'll be a happy camper. But so I'm not going to regret not, you know, hitting the goalpost, uh, but I will be happy along my journey. And I think that's basically my calculus. 
And mm. for me, I genuinely don't care to be the guy that, you know, I love, I have certain friends who just light up the room when we're in a, in a, in a party. And I love just, you know, being in that energy and watching them, you know, make everyone feel happy and entertained. And that's that guy's personality or this girl's personality, right? Or, you know, the person you admire, you know, who's always there for your friends. And those are great, like, things too. And everyone wants all these things. But I kind of, for me, nothing excites me more than possibly being one of those black and white uh, pictures. As weird as that sounds. <laughs> No, I think uh, I think you nailed something there. It's like that desire for greatness, right? The desire to leave a legacy that outlives you. I would, oh. yeah. It, the only two people that would probably even read about an obscure story like that is a kid who's just kind of combing through the history books, and maybe the odd historian who might be writing a paper or something. To be honest, um, like it's. We all hear about the Wright brothers, but do we know what they look like or what they're like? Like, do we know their actual faces? And, you know, I, so I, I don't know that it's um, particularly. So it's, so it's not to be a household name, but to be a studied name. I just like this idea of like, um, you know, like I don't know much about the, the personal story of the founder of Ikea, but I'm admired and inspired by that brand. Um, Lego as well. I did look up his story. Actually, I looked up the Ikea story too, but I can't remember his name. But um, I don't remember. See, I don't even remember his name. But to be inspired by that company, to be inspired by what they did, um, I'd love for knowledge of, to not just achieve what we aspire to achieve, but the story of knowledge potentially being another story that another entrepreneur might hold up as an inspiration to do something else as well. Like to me that one or two people that, you know, we might be on a list of uh, names and stories and companies that inspire them. To me that like, um, you know, I don't know why, but I enjoy that. Like that feels good. I don't know if that's greatness in any way, um, but I think it's definitely uh, my particular, um, you know, vice. Yeah. I mean, going back to that, like, huh? like that, that, that idea of a goalpost, right? So would it be like taking um, knowledge up to be like a 150 year old firm, like General Electric? Yeah, for sure. Out of like uh, Edison, yeah. um, or is it to be more to be like an industrialist where you have a portfolio of activities that you've done that, uh, that has advanced humanity or advanced? No, humanity? no, I, I think for me, it's going to be education all the way through knowledge of being the, the thing. And um, and it being a brand that, you know, just as much as other brands inspired me, like, I think for me that the story, my story, my team's story, uh, the pioneers in, in the company who are pushing on different industry standards and, you know, rewriting the playbook in some ways, um, like our stories will inspire like another generation of entrepreneurs you know, not solely, but among the many stories that might inspire them. The way we look at, at knowledge and talk about all these other companies and what inspires, like Red Bull, for example, like the drink is not healthy, but their media house is an incredible example of, in business history of a much better way of doing marketing than buying ads, right? And uh, like, that's a story we talk about all the time inside the company. In fact, we have our own media house and we, it was inspired by the idea of following the buyer's journey as opposed to the seller's journey and creating value added experiences along the buyer's journey. And so that's like just one of many examples, but like the idea of being inspired by other brands for me that like emotionally, personally, that, that is um, super uh, exciting if, if we achieve something you know, that makes us happy in terms of what knowledge it does, but also on a personal level, um, you know, when we leave our brand and what we did might inspire a few other brands to look at and say, look at what these guys did and look at that mm -hmm. company. And it doesn't have to be an education, it could be in anything, but just in general, this idea of aspiring to human greatness. And like you said, not greatness as in relative to everyone else, 
but like greatness as in bringing out the greatness that's all in all our internal capacity to inspire a few others to like push for their own greatness. And I don't, I don't know how to, like that's, been, that's kind of how I see like it, like that is what, when I hear about these great stories, that's what it does. It brings out the greatness in us. And so obviously if I have an emotional connection to those stories, you know, the neck and I look up to them, the, the thing that I would hope what, you know, if we did our job, maybe someone will look up to us that way too. So it's, there's a kind of a full circle there. Yeah. That's what I'm worried for. Not so much like the being the big dog in a room or mm -hmm. any of that stuff. Like that doesn't really. Yeah. You, you quote a lot of these like nonfiction, uh, nonfiction, like, you know, uh, playbooks of life almost, right? Like these biographies, these uh, personal development books. Do you read sci-fi at all? Do you grow up reading um, sci-fi, any fiction, any I don't, story? I don't, I don't actually, I'm notoriously bad at reading fiction. My wife's a, an avid fiction reader and she in fact dabbles in writing too. But um, yeah, like I watch movies and but then I'm a boring guy in that sense. I, I watch a lot of biopics and even yeah. the poorly done ones. And I can like, which if it's based off a true story, um, you know, I'm probably among the best fans of even a poorly done biopic. Yeah, so I, I speak to that because like, especially uh, fiction, especially science fiction has always inspired like uh, the, the like a compounding, like it's like a compounding interest um, in uh, innovation, right? Like yeah. science fiction has gone through about four, four different like a golden ages, like, like a, the golden age, silver age, bronze age, uh, just like in, um, in, in cultural development. Right. So if you look at like the 1920s, like Jules Verne, like style, um, like science fiction, where anything is possible. Right. Like there could be a whole world in the middle of the earth. You know, the journey to the center of the earth is there. Right? like this uh, obscenely possible ideas were possible. It sparked a whole different generation of entrepreneurs who grew up reading that. But the Silver Age where like, you know, the more Superman, like the comic books came out in the 1950s, right? Which was bounded by science, right? Like, you know, there was these rule books, right? This is possible, this is not possible, but still, you know, the spaceman that is able to go on planets with like just a globe around its head, but the space, space boots not there. Like, you know, the concept of like there's limitations, but not fully understanding was there, which then compounded and brought up another generation of, uh, of like thinkers and, uh, and uh, scientists and innovators, right? In the Bronze Age in like 70s, 80s and you know, going to the 90s, which is more like more nuanced and darker and like, you know, but, but like the, the horrors of innovation and where science is going to lead us and like more dystopian kind of world the thinking came to be. And like the cultural side to like, you know, uh, our, our, our zygist of our times kind of leads to a, uh, the, a new age of thinkers, right? Which brings us back to now, right? Like, Right now we're going through this pandemic and it's so easy to forget that like eight months in it becomes like the new reality the new norm that everything's around this but what i'm what i'm what i'm really interested in is like what are the children of this generation that are growing up around this time who are seeing the world that burn around them metaphorically all right what are what are their interests going to be like what are, you know, how are they going to use technology? How are they going to use the tools around them? Like, are they going to become enslaved to their anxiety and to like the problems of the, of the present? Or are they going to be like, this is, this is what's going on. The world's on fire. How can we uh, mobilize? Right. And, and uh, what do you think? Like you're in this space yeah. with education and like deal, having to deal with this kind of, uh, this kind of base, right? Where yeah. do you stand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's like a, uh... Let me gather my thoughts a little bit. There's there's a few things that come to mind when I when you say that. So there's the um, okay. So there's these two competing thoughts about what's happening to every generation relative to the generation before. Two things that are happening, uh, pushing on two extremes, like burning on two sides of the candle, or pushing on two extremes ends opposite extremes at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, there's this, uh, you know, the best way to sort of let's, the best way um, to kind of imagine what this is like, uh, for me at least it, it, it helped by using a set of analogies. So the first thing is 
you know, knowing that, um, so I'm going to just lay out a few interesting facts and then that will help assemble this visual analogy of one of the phenomena that's happening with each generation. And then we'll do the same for the second, for the second uh, phenomenon. So for the first phenomenon, here's a series of things you got to think about to then appreciate what I'm trying to say. So one is this idea around, um, um, you know, kings and queens do not have access or hmm. billionaires 20 years ago do not have access to certain things that we have access to today. Mm -hmm. Just to appreciate sort of the, the, you know, relative to the richest person in the world 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Click a button and food comes to your doorstep. Yeah. Like there's things we have access to then, you know, now you might think where I'm going with this is related to, um, is to something positive, but there's a negative impact to this as well. So the best way to appreciate the negative impact is imagine in today's generation, let's use a stereotypical, this is a generalization. It's not true for a lot of things, but to use this generalization, uh, this stereotypical analogy, imagine you knew like a billionaire's son. In fact, I, I shared this story with my first investor who was a multi-billionaire. I say, I use this analogy to help appreciate what I thought I was saying. So imagine, <laughs> And I don't know if you had children at the time, but I was just using this analogy, but um, to see if, if I was out to lunch or if it made sense. So imagine a billionaire son. So we're like, okay, that, that person does not have to think about money. They do not have to think about a lot of things that the average young adult or child would have to think about as they grow up and enter into the world because they have money, right? And so, but imagine if like they lost all that money you know, and they had to like, get a job. Oh my gosh, you can already start to imagine how their world would unravel really quickly because they don't understand how to interface with the modern world as we would see it. Okay, now hold that thought for a second. Let's go back to that first thought of how kings and queens did not have access to things that we have access to today. The Pharaoh was poorer than us in some ways, in many ways, right? Okay. So let's create a timeline where you have all these billionaires and pharaohs standing on their timeline and looking at us at 2020 and standing next to us is the billionaire's son, right? And, you know, almost like a spoiled spectrum of things we have access to, right? And we're standing next to the, the billionaire's son saying, yeah, that guy's spoiled, right? And you're looking at the down 100 years, 10 years at some of the most you know, uh, l luxurious you know, folks who had everything, right? And they're, or, or even the generation, not just the, 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 the people at the top of the curve, but just the average citizen looking at us next to the billionaire sign is like, they can't tell us apart from where they're standing. Like the delta between, you know, how spoiled that billionaire son is relative to us from the perspective of people living, you know, 20, 30, 40, 100, 500 years ago, is negligible hmm. and that is perhaps the easiest way for us to sort of appreciate right just how much advancement we've had and how complex the machine is upon which we sit and how little we understand of all the things that like hold it together which makes it both fragile since not a, not we don't have, you know we don't go that deep into the stack that's one aspect of it and um, a lot of us are pilots of everyday life, like the equivalent of a driver for a car. If our car yeah. breaks down, we don't assume we can fix it. We take it to a garage, right? We want a completely new car. We hope engineers will build a new design and bring it out. And then a mechanic will fix it when we're having issues. A lot of jobs, a lot of things that we, we are basically just drivers. We don't, mm. we say, oh, I want to, and I'm an adult and I buy groceries and that's an adult responsibility. And I sit here and I create a list of things I want and I carve out an hour of my time and I go out and buy my groceries. Do we think about the infrastructure that's in place for that to happen? The supply chain, the farming, the agriculture, the, the road, the econo economic system, that's the rule of law or the, you know, the, all the things that like the million little things that, that we sit on top that makes that simple activity, that adult responsible activity that we do that the billionaire son doesn't have to do. You know, do we think about all that? 
that didn't exist. Imagine going to a, if you had to think about food in the middle of a jungle that, you know, where a plane, your plane crash for survival, the, you know, and then you start to appreciate mm -hmm. just how much of a pilot we are when we even buy groceries, but that is an adult responsibility, paying the mm -hmm. bills. And there are a lot of these things that we do that are what we need to do to, 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 to survive. But if you look at those tasks, they're like highly evolved and simplified. In many ways, our ancestors have erected this incredible infrastructure so that we can have this luxurious type of interface with the, the mother nature and the human world. And it's like a, a massive ecosystem that, you know, in some ways is fragile because not all of us know how to build it back up. Have you, have you ever read uh, about anything from uh, Howard Bloom who writes about... Not. No. a concept called the global mind. He builds on top of the framework Richard Dawkins uh, set up, right? Which is idea of memes, like ideas, the framework of an idea is a meme, just like the, oh, the, wow. the, 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 the basis of an idea are memes. So not like the memes you see on Instagram, but like the, uh, the word meme he invented uh, was to describe the basis of an idea. And a bunch of memes put together form a memoplex, just like genes encoding that encode DNA. Uh, a bunch of them create your genotype, right? Right, 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 right. They come together and they encode something more complex. Right. But the basis of an idea being a meme, right? And that intelligence lives outside of us, right? So, yeah, we think about uh, the knowledge that we have and we are able to attain, and like the, a single mind can do. But that is nothing compared to a complex system of you know, a multitude of minds network together through information layers, through speech, through uh, writing, through all these abstraction points of mind to mind interactions, you're networking minds together. But this has been a compounding interest to nature, right? So in a, in a sense, right, our intelligence, the, our neocortex inter intermingling amongst each other's humans are building upon the, the, the existing uh, intelligence of nature, right? Nature being a complex system. And the global mind concept is that we as humans, the individual, internetworked into a larger, uh, larger system becomes more of a general intelligence, right? And you can start thinking about this as if you take all ideas, uh, all knowledge and compress it almost like a three-dimensional map, right? You can see this ball of knowledge, a core knowledge being like, you know, the, the objective truths, things that we know to be true now, you know, completely. Like things like, you know, gravity exists. That's like a we, we understand that now, you know, it becomes ingrained into our knowledge, into our, into our lexicon, right? And then all the new things that are being developed being like mountain ranges that come up on top of this, right? So if you imagine like a, a, like a university professor who's researching on like one particular thing, right? Like, uh, like a one research, one research, but it creates like a kind of like a ridge on this, on this, in this, on this globe of information, right? And then you have all these ridges compounding so that, you know, with the entire division of research committed to like, like microprocessing, for instance, right? Would create like a mountain range, right? That we're, we're, you know, we're building on top of. But certain societies, certain, um, certain cultures, you know, like especially our Western cultures, you know, over prioritize certain types of knowledge and gaining and underprivilege others. So there are trenches in our knowledge, right? Where like we are, we have, we're not developing that knowledge base. And he talks about like the compounding aspect of knowledge and uh, understanding and infrastructure, right? Being, being uh, the compounding effect throughout time, right? Like you kind of mentioned that too, like the compounding technology stack that grows up or, like in, throughout history. Right, we right. we stand on top of that. Right, we're building yeah. on top continuously. So, so, so the concept it's it sounds like a theory around how to model like the collective human intelligence, mm -hmm. and an extension off of let's say like nature, um, like uh, uh, what's it called? Um, swarm swarming like swarm, swarm intelligence uh, yeah that kind of idea yeah and i think that it's it, yeah i gotta look it up so what's it called again the um yeah uh, howard bloom the global yeah that, yeah howard bloom mm -hmm. look it up i have i i saw i have a general way of classifying you know my information and and so there's the um theoretical um um, abstract stuff that mm -hmm. could make for a really great 
um, breakthroughs, like Faraday's theoretical abstract, you know, uh, model of what electromagnetism could be, mm. that then the applied test basically revealed it to be a great model to help understand electromagnetism. But it's not like, and since then, quantum physics has shown that it's far more complicated than that, but it was really good enough to like create, um, you know, the, uh, the entire electrical revolution, right? The, mm -hmm. um, and so there's, there's that. And then there's um, the innovator, like the, in, um, the innovation component, which t Edison was really a great person, uh, 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 you know, next, I think, only uh, Elon Musk uh, came close and is now probably going to surpass Edison in his accomplishment, which is the whole power grid and stuff like that. And I like, you know, and Tesla kind of sat between somewhere between Faraday and Edison in that he conceptualized these brilliant things. And he saw these brilliant things and he was able to bring it to reality. But Edison, Edison actually had to do the grunt work of building the equivalent of roads for electricity right and and put in the grid and there was a ton of things that had to a uh, million little things that had to be put in place and that's the innovation component to bring something to market and mm -hmm. uh, elon's more like an edison even though tesla is named after nikola and there's even a small clip somewhere on youtube that he yeah. makes nuance and it's it's, it's it's literally like yeah and then so there's innovation and then then eventually when things get really boring <laughs> for me is then everything becomes not the work of engineers, but technicians, right? So it's like, okay, the power grid hasn't changed in the last, um, you know, 50 to 100 years. And so it's being maintained. Um, what you're describing, like, I would argue that um, it's a really good mental model to look at nature, to inspire futuristic group intelligence and other things. But I would argue that you know, coming back to your question around the future for, for children, that, um, you know, this, all this human progress is creating a situation where we become more and more like a pilot on a lot of things that could be disrupted, could be improved on, um, and less of a mechanic and engineer. And I think uh, that's one extreme phenomenon that's happening alongside another extreme phenomenon, which is the rate of human progress is moving exponentially. And, you know, you, it, I don't think progress moves without humans pushing along the envelope. And I think, you know how I described like companies and tools are diverging like into this bush, but the bush is getting bigger. So productivity, human productivity is growing. So the net, but the branches are spreading and there's more and more companies. And I think the, even the revenue per employee in, in a company is also increasing drastically which means that employees will have, like companies can do a lot more with a smaller group of people. And if, 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 so if you think of all these tools that are diverging out and all these like inc incredible productivity gains um, within each company, right? I think you're going to get this, like the rate of, <laughs> rate of, um, you know, progress is creating a situation where workers are going from, you know, let's say, if, you know, what was the information age to the autonomous age, a lot of, you know, back, you know, there was a time where you would like put on your resume, I can, I'm fluent with a typewriter or I can, you know, use Microsoft Word. And I think what'll, now it's, can I be, can I help with automation? Can I help design software? Can I help design code? Can I help be in the design process of automation, if not mm -hmm. writing code itself, right? And I think we're moving towards that. And I think, um, that whole thing that makes us different from the rest of the human species, that muscle to problem solve and to contribute to the edge of innovation, I think is going to become the required um, skill set for the average human worker mm. alongside a world where if we're not contributing to building and improving on, on the other end of it, we're being extremely pampered and spoiled on the other parts that are becoming further and further removed from our understanding. So while we become, you know, hyper domain specialized, we have to become specialized in such a way that we're actually contributing to pushing the domain. I think that's mm -hmm. literally where the work is going to be for everyone in millions of companies, you know, all the way to space exploration. Yeah. But at the same time, we're going to look at this entire, everything else that we are interfacing with 
in some ways, maybe we, maybe we become great first principle thinkers and we, we can always like dive in and at least understand what everything else is. But in many ways, we're going to have access to things at our fingertips that are going to make us even more spoiled than before. And so mm. there's going to be these two extremes. And I just can't see like without ideas like universal income and other ideas like to help transition into the future. I just can't see how um, it's not um, creating for a fragile world that we're during this transition. Like there's going to be a lot of fragile moments that, you know, throughout history, there's been moments where things take, you know, taken a left turn. And you can't yeah. predict those things all the time. And then that could also occur during that journey. So, Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite thinkers at the moment is a co-founder of AngelList, Naval Ravikant. And uh, he, he, he rarely comes on podcasts but he, like, or even like publicly speaks anymore. But when he does, he kind of reveals his like hidden truths that we're, we're heading towards. You know, I think you aptly called it when we're heading from an information age to the autonomous age right? Where uh, the autonomy is becoming a great thing. Where the previous industrial revolution, the right, last two industrial revolutions actually, like industrialized and, um, you know, urbanized the population to become into hierarchical orders, right? You get these go- huge, giant government machines, you get these huge, uh, huge uh, corporate machines, and everyone becomes a cog in it. But, uh, you know, like if you look at like Citibank 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, uh, their, their um, what's it, trading group was about 250,000 employees, most of them being number crunchers, just funneling all the numbers up to the decision makers and making decisions. Now that same department that does arguably more transactions, handling more financing, more, uh, more capital is run by four people, right? From 200, uh, over 200,000 employees to, to four people in 30 years. And uh, the way that happens is because of information processing, right? The power of, uh, the power of uh, the, these automation tools coming into effect. And it, it comes back down to, you know, what, what this is going to be coming to do. Like, what are regular people going to do? And he makes this point. It's like the average informa- information age worker, right? Is kind of like the, like during the second, or, uh, sorry, the first industrial revolution, the railroad worker, right? The one that's like driving the physical, physical strength to driving the pikes into the ground to build the railroads, you know, and they have had this like, like 20 years plus of muscle and, 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 and know-how and, and muscle memory into doing this so efficiently. And they'll see this machine, steam powered machine coming down and doing this, you know, at half the pace of them. But then they are two years down the road, they're doing it almost at you know, doubly as fast as that. And still slower than that. And they're laughing at this machine, but slowly over time, just catches up, catches up, catches up, catches up until they're no longer relevant. It's completely, completely uh, mechanized in a way. So just like, you know, yeah, the, the, that that railroad worker was replaced by this machine that can work continuously without break, without requirement. All you need to do is keep feeding it with steam, right? The the power of these uh, um, you know these algorithms, these autonomous tools, yeah, that just run on electricity and and server costs, right? Fractions about fractions, right? So he t- like you know one of the newest kinds of uh, classes of people that is emerging, call called the vector class. Right. The people. Yeah. So the people who control the algorithms, who own the algorithms. Right. So just like capitalists back in the day were like, you know, demonized because, you know, you have this astounding amount of capital. You can use the capital capital to outperform and outmaneuver the average person. Right. You can leverage that capital on top of somebody. The vector class can now outperform people in astounding method methods, like in exponential ways. Why just redeploying an algorithm here and there, you can touch the lives of millions, if not a billion people. Right. And yeah. the interesting thing is the workers are in this in this environment. They themselves do not have control over the vectors that control them and control everybody else. Right. So it's like it's like we're creating the, these, these, uh, these institutions of fewer and fewer people having more and more expanding power amongst all of us. And yet the people who are behind the scenes don't even realize how it all works. But the people who own the me- mechanisms have astounding power over us, right? Like, for instance, like if the Instagram machine, the algorithm detects that, you know, we get more engagement if people are more depressed and starts pushing out like a, uh, to a million plus people more depressive content or uh, images of the exes and stuff like that because it thinks that it is, knows that out of that million, 50,000 people will more likely make a purchasing decision uh, based off of X, uh, you know, X learning curve before. Well, the, uh, the actual engineers behind that, that machine doesn't know why it did that. 
it knows it, it, they built they know that they built a machine that can learn and figure out for themselves like what how to perform that all they all they know is it was given uh, x information to get y result and it just drives to go its y result and all the and a million plus people might say she's might have shown this depressing content where a fraction of them might have like had become, developed suicidal tendencies, uh, created all this negative sentiment, affected their personal lives, has all this astounding effect around them, right? But the, ca- the, the people who run the, who own the algorithms have the, benef- the, the, the beneficial pro- benefits of the algorithms abstract that value, all, for, all without even knowing what happened, right? So this new class of people who comes out um, and is coming about and the, the, the algorithms that are behind this, who have these founding power, right? That, that rise of new age neo-feudalists are coming to be. Well, what you said is what's interesting is like, it's, it's an extrapolation to the future based on existing trends, right? And I find like, um, like, like Da Vinci here, you know, this is an example like this, you know, Da Vinci had conceptualized flying machines in his time. And if you go to the beginning of the more recent Steve Jobs bio, bio, like video uh, movie that came out, um, it was done really well. Like it was probably the best one of all of them uh, in terms of artistic accomplishment. Um, the, the beginning of that video, there was like a, 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 uh, an actual clip of a father talking to uh, someone um, with his son beside him and like the, I think the IBM or some large computing machines back behind him, predicting that one day we will be working remotely hmm. and won't be going to offices, right? Long before the um, PC revolution. Um, and the reason why I brought this up is, and, and so, so like, is that what I find really exciting and interesting about the future is that we can sort of almost see like these possible futures of where it can go. But I find what's really, really hard to do um, is the timing of when what will occur and the natural like way to see just, you know, maybe before it occurs, um, the antis- like being able to sort of roughly predict that like what parts are gonna shift, what parts might not, might still mm-hmm. come around. That part I find to be interesting. And I find that like, it's like a surfer, like knowing when to, if you jump, if you get on too soon, it's you miss the wave or too late or too soon, right? There's just, just right. And innov- innovative, the innovation process requires a little bit more of like, okay, this is it, right time, right place kind of moment. So it's hard to, like what you described, like it was really cool. So there's that one thing I, I wanted to just share, which is really cool because guys like, you said Ravi, his name is Ravi Khan's. Yes, uh, Naval Ravikant. Naval Ravikant. Like guys like him like, can sort of see like, into the future and have this visual image of what will eventually be or oh, one very possible real future, uh, which is really cool. Um, but the hard part is figuring out exactly when will happen what, I think. Harder part mm. relative to that. And then mm. the, other, the other interesting thing I'd like to share, if you don't mind, about uh, something that helps me analyze some of these things is um, uh, I, it's hard. Sometimes when I listen to like, uh, for example, I read this um, uh, book that's a huge, that was a deep influence in, in, in my work, um, The Opposable Mind by Roger Martin. And uh, like he's, I don't know that he's built a company though. Mm-hmm but I know that he's documented a series of companies and saw a pattern. And when he put that together in a book, it literally helped me sort of see, yeah, 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 this is it. And it's almost like, you know, I know my sister, she's a a soprano singer, but when she was growing up, she didn't have any formal training on it. So she was able to sort of sound like a soprano, but one that was very clearly untrained. And many ways, like the book, like what is, was articulating what maybe was happening naturally to people when they're like, you know, innovating or inventing or going through like a, you know, that process of serial entrepreneur. But in many ways, try to turn it into a formal training process. Like these mm-hmm. are the steps they're going through and this is what they're doing. But that was really cool. But at the same time, something that is like, because there's so much information out there and like, I can't like, you know, it's hard to figure out like what, what to synthesize and where to classify. One of the things I use as a tool is I actually, um, 
um, I'll try to figure out like what um, is this the analysis of a shadow, which like which by the way in this particular example, I attribute a great deal to for my own progress because mm -hmm. the, the the what he had studied like those four or five companies, and the way he had uncovered like the thinking and helped me influenced like me systematically trying to pioneer a new category, and so I have a lot of um, I give a lot of credit to that. But at the same time, if he um, was that an analysis of a shadow, was that or was that someone who did this thing, and was trying to describe it, hmm. right? And um, I don't know if it necessarily always helps, but I can tell you an example where I didn't make that distinction and it, I struggled a little bit. Um, so when we raised our seed around knowledge, like we had a lot of inbound requests for digital ads, digital marketing, and stuff like that, and marketing in general, and. And then a lot of like um, sales, you know, expertise, you know, was offered. And one of the things like I didn't know because I was good at building product, but I wasn't good at sales or marketing. I didn't, and I wanted to expand it to other markets. It's like, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so um, I was open to listening and even trying a lot of things. And then I learned very quickly that, um, you know, that whole pilot builder analogy like the idea of we're, we're pilots to a lot of things i actually um, learned that no, so the you, idea that, you know how you reference like we're pilots or we're like drivers in a car for this whole world that we live in we don't really know what's under the hood or we can't fix mm. it so this analogy we use inside the company now builder versus pilot hmm. and so what i learned was so now one of the tricks so what i started to do is i started using this classification trick and i uh i don't you know this is, I'm just giving you, I'm just sharing some insights. I hopefully it's unsolicited, I know, but hopefully, um, you know, I, I found it empowering, so I wanted to share with you. So, yeah, please do. Uh, but it doesn't apply to anything you just said. So, like, you might have to, like, like retroactively check. I'm just using this because I now have this, like, before I dive into a topic, I kind of have these classifications in my head. And it's, it, it's going to be flawed in that it, it might miss out on certain opportunities, but net, net, it's been useful for me. Uh, so, so this builder versus pilot mentality. So what I started doing was I started talking to people again, like I did normally or read books or just read information about sales and marketing and go to market plans and stuff like that. But I started to classify the source of information. And so what I started to do was like, okay, who's talking and where were they in the journey of the company? Right. What is their prior experience? Are they a, an analyst and an this is an analysis of shadows, right? Meaning like the professor who studied companies and wrote a great book, which can be very useful in it because there are certain things that a single entrepreneur who did for one company that only a professor or someone who's gone through so many companies and analyzed them all can show you something that that single entrepreneur can't quite articulate the way the professor, that's what Dean Roger Martin did. But it's the in analysis of shadows and in some ways, right? Because it's not the real object itself because he hadn't done the real thing. But there's some value in that. But then, so who's talking? Is this the analysis of shadows or is this a builder? And if it's a builder, what stage were they building? Or is this a pilot? Meaning, was this thing built? And then they flew it and made it better or incrementally added to it, right? And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a crude, rough in that, like, way to look at things. But when I started classifying across like that, as I started reading information, something really interesting emerged. Like I, all of a sudden I saw some very clear tracks of information that started to fall into these like common patterns, right? And so a lot of the um, VPs of great brands, like head of sales, head of marketing, they, if they were not there from the beginning when the brand was a no brand, and they're there, they became that position at that stage. They're probably the equivalent of a pilot of a jumbo 747, meaning the runway is there and they're looking at dashboards and data and they're making some pretty complex decisions. And the weight of responsibility of navigating um, their company is, is pretty high. And so their skills are optimized for uh, dealing with large complexity and making critical decisions and having Hawkeye ability to like you know, dive into details and, and they need a lot of, but they need a lot of tools and a lot of things have already happened for them to be able to fly that plane. And if they were uh, providing marketing or sales insight when the company was 
just coming out. Um, and I'll give you examples of people like um, Cisco. We I, I had the good fortune of getting a little bit of mentorship with folks from uh, Cisco Canada, like who started it in the early days. Um, in Cisco um, HQ. Um, another one is uh, UFC, um, the chief brand officer, and who was there with Dana when they first started off. The, I, I met a few folks uh, along the way who were, you know, at the early stages, who, you know, in many ways didn't have the pedigree of like. You know, the brand officer wasn't a prior VP from some big name. UFC was doing okay. They were a small company, three million or something like that mm -hmm. at the time. The brand officer was a lawyer, right? Didn't even know why she was hired for the job. Hmm. But it was fascinating to hear that journey and that story. And the story looked very different for emerging brands than other brands. And that all of a sudden you start getting a bunch of insights. Um, and I, and so the thing that helped me was builder, pilot, shadow, and not an, an analyzer of shadows, which hmm. also is really powerful. Okay. But once you know it's an, an analysis of shadows, you're like, oh, okay, I got to do the real thing to finally see the full object. But those shadows can help me. The analysis of those shadows can help me get started. So can you explain the three? It's three different, uh, three different groupings, right? So the analysis and of the shadows, right? And then the builder versus operator of the object. So the okay. analysis of shadows is like an academic who's like studied multiple business or certain mm. and it's like, I'm, and I noticed a pattern. Like Serena Williams can only speak to Serena Williams' journey, but someone who studied Serena Williams and then went to a few other tennis players will pick up on things, but never was on the court, will pick up on things that Serena Williams may not pick up on. Mm. Right? Because you could, they could see a pattern across maybe a group, but it's still if you if you were never on the court, or if you never went through the same journey as you know um, somewhat similar to Serena Williams, you might it it is the, it is still the analysis of shadows, but there's some incredible Insights. patterns that could potentially give the person you're passing this information up a leg up. But if mm. you recognize it to be the analysis of shadows, you can look at the per it's like a blind person trying to describe an object in the room. You know, you, you recognize that's still useful in many, many profound ways. But, and it's unique, it's a unique set of experiences, right? The opposable mind had a series of like these really deep insights that really profoundly influenced my journey. But at the same time, the, the writer and the, and the journey was not one of someone who actually did it, right? And so... It wasn't, and by reading the book, I wasn't going to be able to then replicate the process simply by reading the book. It wasn't the blueprints to doing that thing. But it was something that could, gave me a sense of what the blueprints might look like, or at least like certain characteristics of the blueprint. But until I do it, I would never actually know. Then there was like, okay, well, then there were stages, and I use this, you know, I, I make it sound like, it's a binary thing like builders, pilots, but it's not, it's a gradient and there's a good journey, but there's these stages where like something that's like in the case of a go-to-market plan, commercializing something, there's this builder stage where the brand is no name. Hmm. And then there's like, okay, now it's a, it's a relatively successful brand. And then they all of a sudden they promote like the VP of marketing sales. And it's never the, the early folks sometimes, or it, it, at least in UFC, they maintain that for, as long as they can, and they have continued in many great companies. In fact, ironically, it's the companies that can maintain the original team the longest are the ones that last the longest, I find. Yeah. But um, um, there is a fundamental difference between those two. And I'll give you one example, another analogy I use now to describe, um, you know, something I see a lot. Like I, the pilots, the operators love data. Data, 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 right? And it's like data can tell you whether your idea or where you're going is the right one, but it can't tell you where to go. You can't look at the past to figure out where to go in the future necessarily. You can use it to get some inklings, but the way you figure out the future is you make attempts towards the future. You walk towards mm -hmm. the future, you make iterative, you, know, you test things, you move things, you try things new, right? And, it, and that's a lot of creativity, imagination, like what you just did, which is like paint a possible future. Right, and that's an imaginative process. That is one of the key things, one of the first steps to like um, actually create the next generate, like what the future could look like. Right, that is actually 
more important mm -hmm. than looking at the data uh, or running a split test. Mm -hmm. you, know? so you can do th optimizations with data. You can do incremental. It's a really great tool, but I, 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 liken, it, I liken it to what a stethoscope is to a doctor versus what an ultrasound is for a doctor for a, a baby in the womb. Right. Why do we not? Why do we use an ultrasound for a, ch a child that is not yet born, right? To to figure out their health versus a, a stethoscope to measure the heartbeat for someone who is because there's two fundamentally different stages, profoundly different stages in a company as there is in a in a person. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are, there are abstractions from that, right? It's like uh, the builders don't make good operators, right? Like one of the things when I was younger really astounded me was when like I found out. Steve Jobs, like when Apple grew to a certain amount, he hired a CEO. In fact, he sold the, you know, the, the head of marketing at Pepsi to come in, run, run, uh, run Apple. And I'm like, why would you, you know, you built this thing, like this great thing. Like, don't you want to run it? Like, you know, you're like, it's like building a race car, not driving it. Right. And then you start thinking about it and it's like, wait, it's two different skill sets. Right. Yeah. And, it, and it goes back again well, to extraction. It's like, but at the other. Right. And it's like, and it's like also the uh, Scott Galloway had this great point about uh, innovation as well. The innovation curve. It's like liberals and conservatives need each other because it's liberals who build companies, but conservatives who run them. Right. Oh. And right. And then that really messed with me too. And it's like, you know, uh, it, was, it was a point about American politics right now being so polarized. And it's like, you know, you see each other, each side each other at the end of each curve. But it's like, no, I mean, at this point of intersection, business, capitalism, especially American capitalism, the two kind of fit together, right? It's the liberals who think about and think in new concepts and new ways and humanistic approaches and abstract thinking kind of, kind of you know, lead the innovation way. Or conservatives who are more reserved, more data oriented, right? Who are, who are more about who are qualitative, they operate really well. I didn't right? know that. Yeah, it could be the case. I didn't know. But, that, but you basically... You know, the Steve Jobs example is a great one. Like, mm. um, you know, he, he did a, lo a lot of things right, but a lot of things wrong in that first attempt. <laughs> that, um, you know, is, is an incredible, incredible, more popular, well-known, you know, case study for, for people to learn from. Um, but mm. that's, that's exactly it. It's this idea that there's two. What I, I would argue, though, I would argue that 99% of the business world knows about the operational side of things. Mm. And the part that's a little bit more rare is this phenomenon where uh, an emerging business model, an emerging category reaches product market fit and then go to market fit. It's like lightning striking in the same place twice. And then the small group of folks who now kind of, you know, kind of take it to a certain stage where then it becomes more of an operational element. Like there's more of the operator environment um, that could take, take over at that point, perhaps. Yeah. And that, I would argue that that um, 99, like 99 percent of all business activities, even within every business, like in the vast, if you look at the lifespan of a business, um, but also across just all business activities, any given point in time or one business and through its journey, when you look at its entire life, you know, shelf life, um, no, no man-made thing lasts forever. Just a general rule of thumb. So everything will end be a hundred years or 150 year old company, even in an ideal circumstance, everything ends. But when you look at the vast majority of the pie chart, even across time for one company or at any point in time across 99% of uh, common knowledge and business culture is around operator. And what's yeah, yeah. really, really interesting um, is it's for the few instances where you learn these, you know, for the most part of every other, for the rest of the business world, this, that skill set's absolutely useless. But for the few moments in history or time or in your company's history where it's useful, right? It, you know, it's often, a, um, it's often a, a culture clash with the rest of what we know need, needs to happen in a business. I, I, I find, and there's been mm. so many great examples of uh, I've found and collected over a little while to show that it, it is happening. Um, it, it is still not well discussed, 
Um, although I would argue that that's changing in the next 10 to 50 years, I think you're going to see more and more people articulate thanks to the work, foundational work of Eric Gries and Steve Blank and even Roger Martin and Opposable Mind. Like this, like a lot of that work is actually helping articulate the process and demystifying mm -hmm. it, but I still think it's often at a culture clash. And I think why this happens is imagine if 99% of the population is use a cooking analogy, you know, went to a kitchen, saw a certain set of ingredients and every time they saw these ingredients, they knew they can cook a really good, I'm gonna use like a Sri Lankan recipe, mutton curry. Okay, and it's like, oh, you got this, 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 that's mutton curry, here we go. And 99% uh, in a company's history or across the or world, for success, you know, this, is like this, is, this gets you mutton curry and that's what success looks like. And then, so it's the same raw material, same inputs, right? But then mm. for, to uncover a new business model, this niche odd skill that's not properly documented that likely will change soon. Um, you know, some guy like Steve Jobs or others come in and say, okay, let's do this. This is what the opposable mind is documented really well. And say, okay, um, you know, I'm gonna, I think there's an idea here. There's an opportunity to mix this idea from this industry and this idea from that industry. In you know, if you look under the hood, you apply first principles or think like an anthropologist, you could sort of see a future where these two things could work, but we need to run these tests and sequence it this way to uncover this potential innovation. And then eventually potentially this hybridization of two or three industries to create this whole new experience that you know no one imagined would make sense for a business model, a new industry. Yeah. That whole process like <laughs> is like looking at the, the sad part is you go to the same kitchen and you look at the ingredients on the table and then you call a few folks and say, I see a future where this could be the case. When, and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're cooking mutton curry today? No, 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 no. These ingredients, we're gonna cook something else. Gotcha, something else, all right. So then we start doing it, it's like, and then guess what happens? Like the mutton curry habits kick in, right? The mm. cooking, you know, like you start doing these things that, and, and it's like, trip. It's you're tripping. These two worlds are tripping. So what is, and I can tell you, I can point out very specific points in business history where I know this happened. It's, some of it's well-known and documented. Some of it's like, you gotta look at the clues. So when Steve Jobs um, created sort of the, uh, I think it was the Lisa, he took his best engineers. This, at this point, Apple was successful. He took his best engineers, right? And essentially put them in a room and created a pirate flag, which I think was a stupid move. <laughs> and try to I there. love that story, <laughs> but okay. Yeah. But to make to antagonize like the mistake he made, and that's a reflection of his vulnerability, was to antagonize the other groups who were, you know, his his it was his company. He's the shareholder of. They're all part of the same family. So that was a lack of emotion. Like, that was a you know somewhat underdeveloped on the emotional scale. Mm -hmm. uh, some maybe vulnerability, some fears that were causing to do that, but essentially like the, but he was right to put him in another room in my opinion and it's because you can't ex like it looks like you're about to destroy uh a mutton curry a really good opportunity to cook, cook mutton curry today that's what it looked like you know from mm. uh from the perspective of everyone outside because this is what 99 percent of the world knows in terms of yeah. documented best practices so going into a room with your best engineers and it's, and by best, it usually is people who've been with you in the early days, who was crazy enough to say, I don't quite understand this process. At, at worst case, I don't quite understand this process, but we have a history together and he tends to, you know, pop out on the other end with a surprise, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll go along. We'll be his sous chef today in his kitchen and just do what he wants to do until something pops up. And Something along that line is kind of key to uh, the success of innovating something new. This happened again with Henry Ford. You talked about, uh, you know, sometimes you can be one and not the other. So here's a guy who invented an incredible car, got investors to, to uh, invest in his first company. It collapsed because he couldn't produce 50 cars. People were willing to pay for his cars and he couldn't produce 50 cars out of his assembly line, right? And so he went bankrupt. So anyone looking at that situation, oh, what was his mistake? Didn't understand how to mass, mass production, right? 
I love this story. And these are, mm. these, these are the reasons why I'm so inspired by these human stories, because you know what happens next. This is the father of modern mass production, the assembly line, right? The pioneer of, right? This is why these stories are so special, right? Um, this guy sucked at this. Gandhi, why is his story so special? This guy was like, he, he couldn't get a job in India because he was too shy as a lawyer in, in, in Indian court, right? Like what, so, what is that story special? Anyway, so here's what he did. Okay, so now this guy's second time around, second act, he's building incredible cars. He's created essentially an incredible assembly line. He's mass producing cars. Many cars are out the door. One of the most successful car com companies in America, Henry Ford. So I would argue he's a good operator now, right? Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good operator. Builder, yeah. operator. Here's a guy yeah. who did both. So then why does he do the next? Here's the next move that con confounds me. So you're a good operator. You're a good builder. So then he decides he has an idea for, and he's been collecting these ideas for a completely new car, the Ford Model T, the car that will eventually replace horses. So what mm -hmm. does he do? He decides to create a garage locks up the garage no one's allowed to come into the garage except for a handful of his best engineers and he begins to go to work for, on the ford model t hmm. why the best operator in the world best builder has trouble explaining to the rest of his company that looks up to him and respects him on why why his process inside that garage has to go the way it is and can't be interrupted <laughs> by everyone outside that garage. Okay, so I have, I have two abstractions, like two objections to this, right? Okay. Well, two, two thoughts to add to this. So I don't think it was, it's a confounding of interest, right? Or it was like a, a communication problem, with both the jobs and with um, uh, Henry Ford. So I think it's in the nature of a builder to, to work on new projects, the work of the next thing. Right. And I think that that was a conflict there where sometimes when you have when you're forced to be an operator and you have to control the machinery and control everything forward, it prevents you from doing what you're good at. Right. So you kind of build a division. And what uh, the, the story you told about Steve Jobs, about him dividing the Lisa team, right, creating these in groups within the company. It's like a known psychological hack. Like I would argue like Steve Jobs is naturally really gifted at psychologically hacking people. As like how to bring out the astounding truths about them, right? So the pirate flag was not an internal thing, was an, was an external thing. So the pirate flag was in response to Xerox who complained that they stole uh, the graphic user interface from them. So the story was uh, Steve Jobs, uh, Steve Jobs and, the, and the, the Apple team were pitching to Xerox at the time, hugely larger than them, right? Multiple times larger than public traded company. And the, they're talking to, the, talking to the CEO and in the corner, was a team wheeling by uh, a computer with a mouse and a keyboard that no one's ever seen a mouse before. And Steve was like, hey, wait, what is that? It's like, oh, these are interns, co-op students who built this thing on the lab, the back of it. He, Steve Jobs looked at this, completely forgets about this pitch to Xerox about you know, what, they're, what they're there to pitch for and the product uh, and the market fit for the, the Apple computers at the time and says, can, I take the, can we have this? <laughs> And the head of Xerox, not knowing what it was, or like just thinking it's a, it's a back, backroom project by a bunch of interns, is like, sure. And just literally Steve Jobs and his team wheeled out the first graphic user interface with a mouse and keyboard that was built, like hacked together by a group of interns at Xerox into the parking lot. And in the parking lot, as these students were wheeling it out, told the guys like, you know, if you want to come work for us, we'll hire you full time. And the summer after, these guys came and worked for them. And Apple had the first graphic user interface, had the first GUI functionally ready, uh, you know, commercialized uh, the, the, the keyboard, right? The, 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 sorry, the mouse. And, you know, leaps and bounds ahead of the, of the competition because this, this person saw an abstract idea that could become something, right? And then when Xerox complained, he raised up this pirate flag and, you know, Picasso's quote, right? Good, art, good artists create, right? Great artists steal as a justification saying that you don't know the value that you had, we took it and made it something calm down. And then there's a pirate flag with a signal to everybody else saying that, you know, this is what we did, we're not ashamed of it, but also internally build this culture of rebellion, rebelliousness and bind the company together. And arguably like that idea of like, we're doing something wrong. We're like pirates, you know, we're, we're, we're like, we're revolutionaries, we're, you know, these, these group of misfits bound together by this solemn vow 
uh, really brought the company culture towards like, we got to do something great and we got to keep compounding that greatness, right? And that hacked the, the creative juices out of each individual, be part of that, that, that whole that goal. So like- A uh, story about him at Xerox Parks, there's a video of him uh, in Next Computing, talks about how there were two other things he saw that day. And mm. he was so amazed by the first that he completely neglected the, neglected the other two. And um, which was network computing, I believe, and there was one more. And this idea that, um, you know, uh, that there was so much innovation that day in that room. You're, so, so it's true that he used the pirate flag analogy, um, it had very different intent. Mm. Like my point was, he used it, it started to morph into more than one thing. He started yeah. using it to internally divide the two teams. I think it, um, and it may have, and you'll notice that if it was something that he felt was useful, because obviously he achieved mastery, um, as you say, um, in on the emotional side of things, the psychological side of things, in terms of leading a team, um, he would have kept. Like I would argue that if it was that iteration was the ultimate form factor of what it needs needed to be or continued to be, he would have kept that in his second act, right? Like when he came back, mm. like it was an evolution in his thinking around that, as well, at least from what I can observe. And what I observed was, um, you know, he, he used this thing to sort of pit the different groups together. Um, I think it was maybe a way to help motivate the core team, but he was building on a, he was creating a debt, a leadership mm. debt that he was going to have to pay yeah. the other team. Oh yeah. Like all relationships, you know, you can withdraw from that relationship. It was um, a short-term move. It was short-term moves, right? Yeah. Movements. And I think that's what it goes back to builders with operators, right? Having that two-sided thing is like someone yeah. needs to come in because it, it goes back to that, right? It, like imagine like you're a company and you're really good at one thing, like you're a salesperson, really good at sales. And then because you're good at it, you get promoted to manager and now you're managing salespeople. Just yeah. because you're good at uh, one activity doesn't mean you're good at managing other people. And that's the same exactly thing- it. And That's the same exactly. thing, right? Like when you're running the ship, it's different from building the ship. Correct. Right. And going, you're hundred percent right. What's more well documented running ships or building ships? You tell me, I, I'm not sure. Like I, I, I immerse myself on the building side of it. Right. No, but I, but not, the, but I mean, in general, like we should know this, it's basically mm. running ships, right? Okay. Uh, it should be 99% of all business activities running ships, mm. right? For the most part, incrementally improving it, I'm going to put under the bucket. This is again a very uh, binary way of looking at things. It's more of a gradient, but just to help sort of create a sort of a clear, to help illustrate a point. Uh, Ninety-nine percent of a lot of business activity is either optimizing or running an existing ship. Gotcha. Okay? Whereas this building phenomena, it's almost like the birth of a new star. Hmm. Or something. It's like it's a rare event, right? And two lightning strikes on the same place multiple times because a series of innovations or discoveries both on the product service side and the business model side, all kind of, you know, happen. And all of a sudden, okay, they're to, to create those moments. I think that's a rare event, but the off, well, I would argue that um, it's harder to, it's, it's harder to get information on the building, but there's way more documentation around the running and organizing. Mm -hmm. And so because there's a lot of known knowns in that, it may be unknown, maybe in, uh, a known unknown for most people because they, they, they may not have done it run a large organization, but um, because it's an unknown known, there's a lot of readily available mentorship information to, to really do that. And you have to recognize that you might be weak in that area as your organization grows to go get, go get that information. Mm. Really, like understand building this doesn't mean you're good at running and really come in humble, which is why like even uh, Google and a lot of people step down and let another CEO take it public. Those things make a ton of sense because there's a, like some things, sometimes these things move so quickly that you can't scale your learning as quickly as it did. Mm -hmm. But I would argue like a lot of the stuff on, on the running and the optimization, that's what business school is. When I was doing the yeah. MBA, I thought that's, I thought a business like a startup is a smaller version of a larger company. Yeah. But I found after reading Steve Blank's work and Eric Lee's, I realized, oh my God, everything I learned here. To be honest, I was on the shelf. And I have to ignore my instincts here. The, there you the go. Recipe, right? Even everything I learned at Microsoft, everything that taught me success. And mm -hmm. I have to act like a high school dropout right now 
to start knowledge book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was the craziest, like I had 180 of like dismissing all that I knew to go after this thing. And if and I, I was my qualifications would have been just as good as a high school dropout in some ways. Mm-hmm. Or like a, just a graduate of high school, let's say. But you know, I didn't need the engineering degree necessarily. For that. that's, that's that's really interesting because when you, when you first talked about going to a business school to learn how to create a startup, like that was confounding to me because that's the exact opposite of everything we know, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. you, know, you you go to business school to learn how to operate an existing company. There's no actual structural was, way to learn how to build a company, ignorance, right? That was me yeah. not knowing. So I was giving you my journey, but it doesn't mean it was the right one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So and so, so <laughs> I mean, now all that information, you know, thank God, like I can, like it's useful now, right? To be able to run and scale a, a company and to have those carry those conversations, the business literacy is is useful. Yeah. It can be learned by any founder uh, if they were positioned right, set up for success, um, and in what you know, if it's what they want to do, or and if their skill sets demand it and they rise to the occasion, right? Um, can be learned but um the thing that you know you know i'm putting my neck out here and talking about today i in some ways but maybe you know relative to the guys in the valley they're way more uh, forthcoming of this i think there's going to be a lot of people talking about this concept uh builder versus operator and the, you know the the shadow like the analogy of like, like the cave i think that helps a lot of in some ways but I think I think um, the process is not really well documented, and everyone sees you know I, I mean, two brown guys talking about it, so we're using a mutton curry analogy, which is <laughs> a sign of the times. But like I think it's I think it's going to be one that uh, more and more people will see. And anyway, so coming back to how I bucket things, I bucket things this way. And when I started doing that, I started realizing, oh my gosh, there's a like I now know how to take a brand that nobody knows and introduce it into a new market the way, um, you know, every brand that had to do this, do that. And that looks, the tools are different. Think more like ultrasound versus a stethoscope for an adult, right? Mm. Like the tools are so fundamentally different. And in some ways you can put those tools down and then move to a stethoscope for efficiencies purposes, right? And in some ways you need to have those skills to go back to the ultrasound to create the more sophisticated tools to go into to break a new market, like having people who have that skill set or cultivating it and they stick around in case you you know your industry gets disrupted to go back and do that again, that's super powerful. And I think that's yeah. what is usually lost in companies when those you know early founding teams that have the both skill sets of building using an ultrasound you know, equipment and a stethoscope can oscillate between the two. But if we're getting disrupted or we need to change our business model, can go back to the ultrasound tools and other, you know, you know what I mean? Like the builder tools yeah. and, and know how to oscillate between those two worlds. I think it's every company's interest to create, you know, leaders who can move between the two worlds and, and hopefully create a, a company that um, has those folks all the way through so that if you ever get disrupted, you can, you can re, you know, disrupt yourself, I guess. Well, anyway. I mean, so talking on that and, you know, this is a shifty topic, you know, you, you know, knowledge hook, the trajectory now that you're on, right. Talking about build diverse operator, where do you see uh, change, like uh, structural changes happening? Yeah. So, uh, so once I realized like, Hey, this is the, this is, there's a, there's a whole different, und- not properly documented business class of activities here one of the first structural changes that happened was the way we went about doing our go-to-market mm. um, and one of the first uh, terms we use inside the company is this concept called the garage you know um, paying homage to the ford model t garage mm-hmm. and the idea that hey the rules and the rituals inside the garage are different from the rules and the rituals inside the scale up side of the company Right. And we started to, and I don't know that this is necessarily the most efficient. I think Elon has like a, uh, a some probably slightly like a, a much way better, you know, methodology than this one. But I know that there's cracks even in his model because I've done a little like snooping around, you know, of 
you know, podcasts and other interviews, not from Musk. I've, I've watched as much of his stuff. It, it, it sounds like as you probably have uh, with Steve Jobs and others as well. Mm-hmm. But um, I watched all that stuff. But I, I found some of some of his high end executives, right? One happening to be Tamil J, the former CIO of Tesla, mm-hmm. and um, who started Techion just recently raised like 125 million round. Yeah. Um, if you go to his podcast and go to the 14 minute mark on his podcast, you will find him talking about some of his interactions with Elon, but in a way that was really unique to me. Okay. Where it indicated to me this sort of cultural, you know, difference of opinion on a process or approach that strikes, had similarities to what I found. uh, Man, this is pretty... uh, you know, I'm just speaking my mind, but it's, it has similarities to that whole, you know, uh, mutton curry, traditional, like, you know, the, this is one approach versus another approach with the same recipe. So Jay started to say, Elon got a little hands on in certain places, a little more what might be perceived as micromanaging, mm. right, where I would have not done that as much. Right. And I think. There's a couple of things I think about. And you remember I told you I bucket, you know, um, you know, I create classifications just to help me. It's not to say that those classifications would be wrong in any way, but it helps to create a little bit increased net net. It has benefited me more. So I said, okay, wait, this is a guy who's done this at least four or five times company, like in multiple industries. This is Elon Musk. Right. And Mm -hmm. And then within Tesla, he's even articulated as a chain of startups, right? In his last quarterly, there's a number of interesting innovations and uh, business model innovations across the vertical stack, yeah. right? Energy to uh, transport. Battery to logistics, um, yeah, solar. Just, there are startups all innovating across each stack. So this is a guy who's like, you know, you know I don't know which Greek philosopher had this in the book, but if, if, a, if a person does this multiple times, there's mm-hmm. something about the person. So, you know, if he had those odds, like in a casino, he'd get kicked out. Right? <laughs> and so yeah. there's something here. That isn't to mean that you blindly follow everything he says. So it's, you mm-hmm. should follow critical thinking and stuff like that. But, but, but here's where I thought, okay, I can give Elon, you would expect some evolution if, he, if he's done this so many times and he's getting faster and more efficient uh, in terms of clip rate. And by the time he met Jay and they did their whole ERP system, this is a lot further along in his journey. So at this point, you would have identified a few efficiencies. Mm. But if you're struggling and you find yourself in the room and you're micromanaging, at least that's what's perceived by the other person, then that tells me that there's certain things that don't scale, which is the innovation process. And you haven't figured out a way to communicate that or create structures in your organization to prevent people who don't understand that from feeling that way. Or maybe there's an interfacing moment there. I don't know, like where you have to move from innovating in the garage out. But there's this, there's, there's a, there's still some uh, flaws in the, the the transition from innovating to, to to bringing it into scale. There's something there that's missing, and it, it tells me that if Elon's struggling uh, to be able to build confidence during that period and that process and transition, despite having done this millions of times before. Um, there's some, something still uh, missing in the fabric of our conversations, mm-hmm. in our understanding of tool making and tool building. Now, yeah. why would Jay, now let's, remember I told you earlier, you should look at people in their journey, right? Mm-hmm. So Jay is an example of someone who's built something, Techion, right? Um, if you go to this article called Search Versus Execute in Steve Blank's work, talks about when you come up with a new business model, right? Um, you go through what's a, dis- a discovery process. You're not a, st- st- you're not a smaller version of a large company. You don't have to replicate, um, you know, you're not replicating an existing model. And when, you, when you're using the search versus execute, when you're using the lean startup approach, it's, it's meant really for like, especially for, coming up with a new type of business model where you don't know the customers and you also don't know who the buyer is, right? But when, but what, if you think of what Techion is, it is 
offering what Tesla does for Tesla, it's offering that for the other rest of the automotive. So you don't necessarily have to go through the same innovation process. You have to, to discover all the pieces. Well, a lot of that is, that's a, now, that's a startup category that was innovated that day at Tesla. And a lot of it is now spawning an industry of which I think Techion is a part of. Hmm. The modern way of purchasing cars. Think about it. Like that is what was done. Like I'm not like you can purchase cars for Tesla online. Techion is now expanding that. And that's what makes Techion really special is for the cars that are going to be alongside Tesla for the future of driving. Techion is the company to go with. Right. But the process of doing that maybe doesn't require the same garage in, you know, trial and error of like, how would someone purchase something online if it was already gone through once before? So the, the philosophies that you may need in this weird, unique moment to pioneer the concept for the first time, mm. right, may not be needed once the concept's out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is not personal. This is just me. And I, 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 I found that um, I was, see, one of the things I do is when I struggle with something, I dig and I search and like, I, I remember meeting uh, Praveen, the head of growth for Tesla yeah. at the time. I went, I ran to the conference, asked if I can meet with him after. Cause I was like, I was, I wanted to understand like, yo, if, I, 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 should I be buying ads? If, 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 I, if in order to grow a company, like, you know, uh, do I need to use it, have an ad strategy? Well, if Facebook and Google, the biggest companies for ad revenue, you know, uh, you know, if they didn't use ads, then should I? Mm -hmm. Right. And because then do they use billboards where they like, how do they grow? Right. If so, how does other companies, like, how do you grow without like, so, so I needed to have that question answered. So when I met with him, he walked me through like what the growth team, how they're structured, the kind of things they did in there, nothing was related to ads. And so I needed that information. So I was willing to go scout that information, mm. go look under a rock if I had to, right? Um, and beg for that information because I needed the information for my own learning journey. So I have that tendency to go dig and dig and dig. So I was looking for executives talking about Elon Musk on the flip side. Like, yeah. what is your perspective of this process? Because if you further, like if he's done this six or seven times, by now he's probably refined it, that you wouldn't feel like he's you know, he would have been efficient at this. So I was, I didn't know what way, which way the answer was going to be like, but as soon as I heard him, as soon as I heard the interviewer say, tell me about Musk. I, I was like, okay, I think I gold. I actually took a screenshot, a link and I passed it to a friend of mine. So then, and I was like, Hey, I think I found someone who's going to about to spill out the answer about that thing we used to talk about, which is micromanagement in the garage. Hmm. I don't know what Jay's going to say, but I'm going to start playing and watching. Let's see but I wanted you to know that I have literally this exchange with another friend of mine. And then I watched it and I was like, Oh shit, Elon Musk is struggling with this. Right. So my, by general consensus, my general now belief is I think he has a faster way to organize garages and in these innovations and then bring it into the production line or like the scale up process. I think he's rapidly, but I think it's still rough around the edges. And I think the general process that, happens in the garage is it has got to be a small team you can't scale it and there's and it's got to be a small trusted team that's willing to operate similar to what a you know michelin three-star restaurant might look like when it's trying to decide the menu you have your sous chefs you have some r d and they could be incredible chefs but in that moment they're a sous chef you know helping you know execute certain parts of what will be a really quick experiment then you run the experiment, then you pivot and like you're failing, 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 failing until you kind of have a better understanding of your customer, better understanding of this, you know, the technology you're wielding. And you're trying to find this, you know, form this new human habit that didn't exist before, created a new value curve that has different economics tied to it, you know, all this other stuff. Hmm. And you're just trying to do this process really quickly until something latches and you're like, okay, we validate it. Now you bring it out of the garage. Now we begin building the tools for scale. And that process uh, is not very different from a Michelin three-star restaurant that's about to launch, a chef with some sous chefs in a room designing the menu or run, doing the R&D to basically work towards the three-star restaurant rating. And that is not scalable. And for whatever reason, it's not properly documented. 
and often creates for a lot of culture clashes. So inside our company, we have this thing called the garage. Um, we build a lot, my calendar has a ton of these garage meetings and then management meetings and hmm. data room meetings, right? But these garage room meetings are like three hour slots. We're going in. Uh, and if I start having a, if there's a garage meeting, there's probably three or four of them for like, and rapid prototyping, rapid building. And this organizational structure is so flat and it's like a startup. And because we're also a vertically integrated strategy, our strategy is a vertical integration one. I have multiple, what appears to be startups that are working together and are like basically pioneering these different concepts, mm -hmm. a media house, a consulting house, you know, the home product, the school product, there's a whole bunch of things happening. They're all connected and they move in that direction. And I, and I find that this concept of a garage um, and the rituals and the understanding in the room is so different from the concept of scale up, which is more common to what I learned in business school and what I had in my prior experience as well. So this is a long way to answer the yeah. question. But I love it, this because like you're broken like, down. Best practices inside the company and my learning, so. No, absolutely. No, I, I love this because you structure yourself and your innovation to, like, like an engineer would, you know, <laughs> and you've broken it down into this kind of subsets and, and things like that. But I, I guess my question is knowing what you know and knowing all this, like, you know, would you remain as, as a builder, would you ever bring in an, an operator, someone to steer the ship after? Would you, would you step down as CEO? Absolutely. If I had to, like, I, so the, I mean, so my vested, I mean, it's, it's in my vested interest to step down to find the best people for every position at every stage of the company. It's in my best interest. Mm. My, one of my uh, co-founders, when we started, I was the emotional, passionate guy and he's the programmer and the rational logic guy calm. Right. And so I said, Lambo, you're going to be the chairman. I'm like, when we first started, this is how we structured. So if there's anything you disagree with, you can override that decision. Right. Right. You're my, I want you to have my foil. I just have a, I have a general, like, I don't have a general attachment to any role in the company, including mine in that sense. Um, that being said, um, as you said, uh, being a builder doesn't make you a great operator. And someone with the, an imposter syndrome as deep as the one that runs in me and knowing that I am currently the CEO of the company and that because I helped build it, I don't necessarily know how to help scale it. Where do you think I will go next in terms of my learnings? The operational yeah. side, right? Yeah, yeah. There I found some really, like I sifted through a ton of rubbish, mm. like garbage dumpster diving through knowledge and books. And, and something emerged like, uh, recently around uh, this this 30 minute video um, by Chris Machesny, I think his name was Steve Machesny. He's, I connected with him on LinkedIn recently. Uh, wrote about, uh, he wrote, he co-authored or at least he, he consults for um, Stephen Covey, uh, the, the company. Mm -hmm. Stephen Covey passed away. Um, the Four Disciplines of Execution. And it was uh, this workshop and book that was a derivative of another book by uh, a Harvard professor on execution in, in general. So as I said before, like, and as, as you know, like since 99% of the world runs off of things that exist today and like repeatable processes, it's really well documented, but then it's going through all of that stuff and figuring it out. What I learned, um, you know, I, there's many things that can help, you know, you know, create operational excellence in a company. Um, one of the most important is people culture, right? Um, but the other around business activities is actually, um, you know, being able to classify the various business activities and have the right tools to be able to, to know how to, 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 to empower and measure them. And so something I, um, something if you, if you, I encourage you to look at is four disciplines of execution, which talks about, the importance of focus as it relates to, you know, creating an organization or a team that's really, you know, hits a goal, be it in this case, a growth goal. Um, it, there's a number of really great best practices I picked on the way. And one of the things I started doing is meeting with CEOs, well-run CEO companies, right? So the, um, 
Uh, one of my mentors was uh, the Rogers president. Prior to that, he was a CEO of um, Cisco. And just meeting with other folks who, you know, a lot of my investors are have run companies and, you know, getting coaching along the way and trying to, to do that. What has been easier for me is that information has been more readily document has been more documented far better than the other one. And there's a lot of people that you can turn to. Brian Chesky, the Airbnb, Airbnb C, uh, CEO, I would argue is probably one of the best ones of the, of the younger generation, given how he's handling the crisis, and navigating it. So there's, there's a ton of great people and a ton of great uh, mentors and information that you can find along the way to do that. But the way knowledgeable will probably be organized all the way through, it, I think it, to take a playbook from Tesla is to constantly innovate across all the different functions um, and, and then take all that innovation and improvement downstream into the scale-up process. Um, so if, if the, alongside the operational pieces, and I think that, um, I think that might mean that if that is the model, then I'll probably continue to, to lead the innovation side and the company and have a ton of really great operational excellence through, uh, you know, bringing in the right people to help run those parts of the company. Right. And so that's probably as long as that is the model for knowledge to like constantly push on the innovation and functionality and stay competitive across those, you know, the various areas that it's competing against. And I'll probably be CEO and have some really great operators to help run. Uh, but at the same time for them to do their job well, I have to also be able to, you know, understand and, and be able to even in many ways execute operational excellence myself, otherwise it's hard to empower them. I feel like whoever, like Bob Iger, Bob Iger is a great example of this. It doesn't matter who's the CEO, whether it's a builder or, or um, a runner or someone that could do both. Ideally, it's someone who could do both. But at the end of the day, even if you can do both, a company is either going through in terms, you know, like at the top, like there's, you're prioritizing constant improvement or you're prioritizing, you know, scaling market share optimization, right? Um, I think, I think like, uh, you could have the Steve Jobs model with a Tim Cook reporting to Steve Jobs, or you could have the Bob Iger model where you have, uh, Lazarus, I think like the, some of the creatives from Pixar reporting to Bob Iger. It doesn't matter which one's on top and which one's not, as long as there's, um, someone who at the CEO level has an appreciation for both sides. And I think Jobs had an appreciation for both the operational side and the innovation side. Mm -hmm. Iger has an appreciation for both the innovation side and the operation side. In his case, since he was the operator, leaning more operator, he really understood the creative process and how important it was to build great movies and stories and how Pixar had that skill and that Disney lost that skill that led him to the acquisition, which then led to all the, the derivative revenue streams that Disney relied on that hinged upon these really great stories being created in the first place. And Bob Iger understood the key essence of that, like a mechanic, even though he was a really great operator manager, he wasn't getting into the creative stuff, though I'm sure he had some editorial oversight or contribution and, or made the effort to pay attention to it, which is really important. Um, whether you're a builder or an operator, you like with creative innovative stuff, there's some editorial pieces that you have to always um, pay attention to. And with the operational side, you have to ritually look at these activities, the executional elements, and really pay attention to the data, really pay attention to the culture, the management layer. There's a number of things you can't ignore, no matter which one you are when you're CEO. Um, but you might lean heavily on one side and rely on someone else to help um, abstract some of that stuff up. As long as you can appreciate both worlds, um, you can lean on one and have someone else support the other. But you have to appreciate both worlds. Yeah. Awesome, man. I think uh, I think that's a great great place to end this. Like, bro, we we've uh, we're pushing. How long was this? This is almost four hours. Holy, Jesus. Right. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm, I knew. I'm, huh? I knew. I was prepared. I prepared myself. I mean, I knew it was gonna be a long one, knowing uh, knowing what you bring to the table. But 
This has been great, man. I think uh, full of insights, uh, really dive deep into a lot of different ideas um, that you, you had. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to like, ad- to digest really like how your thinking strategy and your way of analysis, uh, analyzing things and breaking things down, down to core concepts and principles. Um, I think uh, for whoever gets through these four hours, I don't know if uh, anyone's going to watch this, but uh, I definitely watch out, watch out for like the six people who do, you know, what I mean? that's, all, that's what this was for really yeah. for me to unpack my thoughts. To, it was a good time with you. And for the six people that do email us, <laughs> yeah, definitely reach out. Uh, Travis, man, congrats again on the Series A. Uh, I think you are on a great trajectory. Um, I'm looking forward to what you guys accomplish through Knowledge Hook and into the future of education and, and the, uh, improve as you get. And there it goes, Harley. And with that, we'll end this episode. Try to stick around for a quick debrief. But the guys uh, and the six people who uh, watched all this, uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>